If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. I know you're happy, dude. Wait, what song? Wait, can't I can't I feel? I can't feel the rain. I can't feel the rain. Yeah, I, just, Justin, I does, said, <laughs> Justin does a little bit better. A little bit. Yes. I said this before, but <laughs> when Adam sings, it sounds like a guy who sucks at singing who's trying to like sound bad. You know what I mean? Like uh, it sounds like you're doing it on purpose. Well, like you're a guy who already sing. sucks who's trying to sell. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it. You're close there. I mean, I'm a I'm a guy who really I'm sucks at it. Who's trying, trying to sound, sound really good, but it just just gets worse. It just okay. Do that again, but try to sound worse. I want to see if it happens. Oh, try and sound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe I'll sound good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ready, go. I can't. Wait, what is it? I can't. Oh okay, no, so try <laughs> try to sound worse. Oh, sound oh. worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I can't feel the rain. Uh, <laughs> they're both I on par. Better. It was on par. Yeah, it's close. Yeah, pretty it's, much. You can't pretty, sound worse. Pretty equal. You know yeah, why? I, because, yeah, I, I don't think you can. <laughs> I don't have. I don't. Have, <laughs> what, it just comes out. I don't have like a barometer of like better or worse. It's just <laughs> however it comes. It out. exists. Well, or there's a. Well, I think. Uh, or there's like a like a. I think I had to come from my stomach, right? Like I can't feel the rain. Wow. No, that just got weird. No, it that, is. I think yeah, that wasn't even normal. I think there's a <laughs> uh, like. I can't pitch it with a girl. Yeah. I can't feel the rain. Wow. You know, like... I'm getting better, I feel like. Yeah. Wow. I think we I, should just stop. Um, I think there's like a, a like a, like physics, there's a limit as to how bad it can get, and then you're hitting it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like the speed of light. Like, there's no way you could get worse. So even if you try to sound worse, you're just at the same bottom. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's the speed of light, but in reverse for bad singing. I'm still in search you of... You lost me with your science. I can't yeah, write. Yeah. He just Sorry. made some shit up. Yeah. You know, I, I believe that you know, whether you're you're a God believer or not, I feel like we all have like these gifts, right? I just, I'm, you know, I'm 35, still searching for mine. And mm. it's not, it's, it wasn't athletics. It wasn't singing. Maybe that's your gift. Uh, yeah. Maybe your gift is I'm, knowing that you I'm, don't have one. I'm, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> I can't, I can't fucking yeah. put a sentence together. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what my strength is. Yeah, dyslexic. I mm. used to be attractive, but as I'm aging here, I'm losing my hair yeah. and, and. It's a diminishing uh, value. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I believe, I believe I'm. You gotta latch on to something else. It's going to come though soon. I disagree. Mm. You disagree? Yeah. With what? Your unattractive um, comment. Oh, you think so? Yeah. So I've known you now for personally for about two, a little over two years, mm-hmm. and you're a slightly more attractive today than you were the first time I met you. Just wow, because you like so. you like you like my handlebar mustache. That's why <laughs> um, you always wanted to grow one of those, could, and I did it. Yeah. <laughs> it could be, it could be. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. Did any of you guys? Mm. Did any of you guys tune into? Tried. Did any of you guys tried. tune into yeah. Hell on Wheels yet? Have you guys watched the show yet? No. Oh man, no, dude. You, no. guys, you guys not Netflix and chill? I this is just right. this goes back to why I'm trying to tell you guys no, I do how Netflix fucking and old we are. I can't keep up with you, dude. No, this the fact can't. that you guys don't know any of these Netflix shows. Oh, we're old. That's what it is. Yeah, we're yeah. old and out of style. You know what it is, Justin? What? what? It's it's uh, he's got time to watch Netflix. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> we're like, uh, we're like, oh my god, I have five minutes. Kids I'm like, everywhere. Yeah, ah! I'm like trying to like take those precious moments and like have a conversation and yeah. then pass out. Yeah. yeah. That's a man. This is I why, know. you know, it Adam, Adam's like, don't okay, Adam's like, do we have to be real or do we don't yeah, have dude, kids? I'm, I'm totally into this Adam's thingy like, he, and that thingy. He looks at his schedule. And he's like, man, yeah. okay, let's see. I did hella work. Yeah. I read three books. I powered it out. I did yeah. some yoga. I had right. some sex. I still, still have had five time. hours left yeah. to watch Netflix. Netflix and chill. You know what? Hey, you know what? Speaking of kids, um, that I don't have any, but uh, I got an <laughs> inbox right. uh, from somebody who wrote like a really nice um, message in regards to you two knuckleheads. Oh yeah, uh, talking about your kids, and oh, this hey. is why I'm always pushing you guys to share more. He was he's a 24 year old parent, and he said it was ex- extremely inspiring to hear you guys talk and share about uh, your relationship with your kids and the things that you guys are continuing to learn and grow from because. Um, that's really valuable advice, man. And you guys, uh, I, w- I wish and I hope that we, you guys share more of that with people because I always get, I don't know if you guys get feedback. Maybe people don't tell you, but people tell me all the time. I don't know why they tell me. Hmm. I'm, the, I'm the one with no fucking yeah, kids. Yeah, that's weird. They should just tell me. I yeah. get feedback, but it's, uh, it's hard for me to listen to. It's hard for me to listen to that episode. Oh, really? It? Yeah, because it gets real deep, you know? And then when I hear it, I'm like, ah, uh, yeah. I don't want to hear that, you know? Uh, yeah. Because then it kind of hits. Well, I haven't been as emotional on any podcast we have done. Literally, we've done almost 500 podcasts. 
the first time ever did I literally like almost cry like three different times. And that was in this episode that's coming up. This oh, my God, with Justin know. Wren? Justin uh, Wren. Oh, man. Was I was right there with you, dude. One of the dude. most impactful uh, podcasts that we did. Totally different. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, lose some people that don't can't get in touch with that side. Mm. Uh, but I hope I that don't we, think so at all. I think people are going to, I mean, You've got this. You big, have to be a piece of shit to yeah, not. Yeah. In, You've got a yeah. big, you know, this big MMA fighter, this this just you know brutal fighter who uh, has his own personal battles, and you know, and you'll hear in the in the upcoming episode here, but he goes to the Congo and decides to become the voice for uh, a, a people over there, the pygmies, and he talks about some of the stuff that he saw and and what they're doing to help them and. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the when you meet this guy, very rarely have I ever met someone where I just you feel they're like they're just this gentle, empathetic, wonderful human being, and you mm. get that feeling immediately when you meet this guy. Again, he's this big guy, could be very intimidating. He's got the cauliflower ear because he was a wrestler and an MMA fighter, and you just want to fucking hug the guy. Because well, his yeah. story, he's just such a good guy. His story, literally, which I you know I was familiar with, uh, you know what he's doing over there. But I wasn't familiar from where where he came from, mm-hmm. which to me that was like that's well the fir- that ties it all in. I mean, it, it makes it so personal. It makes it like you you understand further his purpose and like how he he got to that purpose, and it just just the, it, it sort of establishes this timeline and really connects you to the process of like uh, what it all means and why why it was so impactful for him. I hope and I didn't. Man, I, man, I got impacted by I it. I hope I didn't weird him out because I, I must have given him like six man hugs. Oh, I did too. <laughs> I felt like, I just, I felt I like every- him. I honestly wanted to be like a backpack. I just yeah. wanted to like wrap myself every, around. Every, every time yeah. we, every time we like pause in conversation, I felt like I just need to hug you right now. I, I know, man. I, I wanted, seriously, I wanted to give him some nice, oh my god, you know, cheek kisses. I wanted it because Dude. wow, he's just wow, such Sal. a yeah, yeah, on the yeah. cheek, okay. on the cheek. Okay, but just, get a little far. Yeah, well, uh, well, he's just such a he's a, such. You just a, want to nuzzle up in his beard. He's just such a good man, like a good no, nah, he is person yeah, he is. from what he's doing. And it, you know what? It, I don't know about you guys, but after we were done, I man, I went home and I really. It impacted me so strongly. I really started to think about all the stuff that I'm doing, yeah, and what I should be doing, or what I, you know, what my, what I think my purpose is. And um, oh, brother, your purpose is what you're doing. Here's the deal, yeah, J- Justin. The people that are going to listen to this episode, um, you know, and if it if it impacts you in, in any way, um, I I urge you to go to his fight for the forgotten dot org page mm-hmm. or his water for dot org, which is the number four. Um, and and do a donation. And if you if you don't if you don't have the means to do that, then where you can help is by sharing this. Mm-hmm. If there, if there, I haven't I've never share. asked you guys to share a podcast or share an episode. Um, it, and I know it's hard sometimes to share podcasts because it's not user friendly. But this will also be up on our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So when it goes up on there, you can share it from on there. Mind Pump Radio. It's yeah. a different YouTube. Yeah, channel. Mind Pump Radio. You can find it. I urge you to share this with as many people as you possibly can. This message needs to get out to more people. He's. Yeah. I know he's touring over to Fire and the Kid, and he goes over to uh, Joe Rogan. Uh, Joe right? Rogan. He just did our buddy Jordan at Art of Charm. So he's definitely getting his message out there. And if if uh, M- if our MP family can help out and spread the word spread this podcast as he's, much a, he's a he's a very brave individual we yeah. need more people like him in the world but absolutely but, but what we can do is support people like him because they're so mm-hmm. rare um oh you can also find him on his instagram uh, page at the big pygmy so uh without any further ado here we are talking to uh justin wren you know, when two men with a beard interact each other, the guy with the the, the more powerful, but you have to yield to them. Yeah, you do. You it's like to, it's like Rams. Right you know who has the biggest horns? Hey, yeah. how do you like yeah. that uh, the big top beard, man? How do you like that right there? That oil, that stuff's awesome, right? Man, I like it a lot. Right? Yeah. We just uh, we, we actually just met uh, with the creator. Yeah, you got a nice sheen going last over there. week, Thank and you. then uh, yeah. s- probably when this releases, we'll probably be official with them. Man, that really really like the product they're putting out there, which means I got to grow my beard back. Yeah, yeah. you can just yeah. put you can just put it on you your. Just shaved I just shaved it. Yeah, I got a video of shooting today so He's, yeah um, this guy's doing pissed. a kickstarter for his uh axon yeah. stick that drops uh coming up real soon here <laughs> but man justin man so excited to have you in the house right now you got a, quite the lineup right now you're hopping on some podcasts you just did you just get done with one or where are you head next yeah just got done with art of charm jordan uh, yeah with jordan he's awesome. the yes man. he's our buddy yeah 
He's Good an dude. awesome, awesome guy. So, very cool uh, guy. Very glad to know him. And uh, yeah, we'll be going on The Fighter and the Kid with uh, Brendan Schaub and Brian Callen. Very cool. Uh, and then as the next day, I'll go on Joe Rogan's show again. That'll be my fifth time on there. And he's just so awesome, man. Uh, Joe, that dude. Joe's That's where I discovered you. Yeah, I listened to your guys' interview and uh, got into what you're up to and all that stuff. And yeah, man. Great, great stuff you're up to. Yeah, if you, you if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit of uh, just your story, um, it starts with you becoming a fighter and fighting professionally, and then it takes a very amazing uh, turn. Mm. Um, and you know, for some of the stuff you're doing now, which I have a tough time watching some of your videos and not getting emotional. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really, I'm not a religious person, but we're if like I were, I would, I would yeah. say you're doing God's work. But uh, tell, let's start with your story first. You, you, you're, how did you get into MMA? How did that all? You told us earlier you were into wrestling, and yeah, and what got me into wrestling was basically I had zero, uh, absolutely zero self uh, confidence, self esteem, self worth. Uh, I grew up getting very heavily bullied. Oh wow! Um, and yeah. you're a massive dude. How, yeah, now, how, now, now, I'm, even now I'm a pretty big dude. Uh, oh, you were small. Uh, yeah, this was this like pre puberty type of deal. Yeah, 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 yeah it was, uh, okay. <laughs> and it was. Uh, I don't know, man. I I was I had transferred into the school at third grade and uh, got in a fight the first day of school, but I didn't swing. I didn't do anything. I got jumped on by the, the kid. He's actually in prison right now um, oh, for uh, oh. holding up a convenience store. But um, We know it, who won that, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Right. And no, he, uh, and then him and his friends, and I mean, they just bullied me from third grade through uh, all the way through eighth grade. And I was just a target and I didn't stand up for myself. I didn't fight back. I was invited to, uh, or actually I asked my favorite uh, uh, crush in elementary school, sixth grade, uh, asked uh, Jessica to the homecoming. (laughs) And uh, we have this crazy, absolutely crazy tradition in Texas, Um, but it's homecoming mums. Have you guys ever seen those? No, no, no. Man, they are these massive, just absolutely massive uh, fake flowers or corsages, and they actually have uh, actual size teddy bears on them. What? They have these streamers and bells and whistles, no joke. And the kids spend their whole allowance on this thing to, to give to their date to homecoming. <laughs> oh, wow. Have you ever seen that? No. I'm, wow, I that must, yeah, it's a Texas thing. It's a sure. Texas <laughs> thing. It's only there. And Everything's and bigger and better in Texas, right? Yeah, that's yeah. It, man. And it's seasonal. Corsage, it's, whatever. Right. It's around homecoming. And th- there's people that that's all they do for their living is year round. They're, they're getting ready for homecoming uh, because they're making these wow. homecoming moms that now are ridiculous where girls are having to wear harnesses to get these. Uh, <laughs> oh my there. God. And you can barely see the girl behind the, the mum. Oh. Uh, I'm not kidding. It's 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 ridiculous. Um, and I spent my whole allowance uh, on uh, a homecoming mum, took Jessica, got the streamer that said Justin and Jessica on it, got to the high school stands and we're at the high school game. And actually this was seventh grade, not, not sixth grade. And uh, so it's first year of middle school. And yeah, I, I take her, I'm excited. Um, and one of the notorious... Uh, bullies came up his name was justin as well and uh he walked up and everyone turned at uh, halftime he came up to jessica put his arm out she put her arm around his he grabbed the streamer that said justin and jessica and basically said uh, hey thanks for buying this for her and i'm like what just kind of confused and the whole school's turned around looking at me and uh he's like yeah um you didn't think she was actually going to come with you, did you? Oh, and wow. And just kind of started walking oh, away wow. with her. And uh, everyone laughed. I got laughed out of there, you know, kind of ran down the stadium crying or whatever. Oh, and uh, yeah, then, then the next year it got even worse. Oh, it hurts my soul. Yeah. So the next year was even worse. And uh, and that's the year I found the UFC, though. I mean, I, I it was probably three weeks after, uh, J- uh, well, Jennifer um, was my other middle school crush. And she crushed me when I got to her uh, birthday party and it was a costume contest. And so everyone was dressing up. Everyone was talking about what they were going to wear. I, I really liked her. So I knew she loved Transformers and that her dad worked for Dr. Pepper. And so being a country kid and having some duct tape, I made myself into a uh, Dr. Pepper Transformer from head to toe. Uh, Epic. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, like the, the 12 packs on my arms and, you know, making a chest plate and having a sword in one hand and a, a birthday present in the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and got to the, got to the house and went inside and uh, her grandmother said that she was going to love it. I get to the backyard, open the door and was just met with some cameras flashing and fingers pointing and, uh, and, or just like one or two flashes. And um, yeah, uh, Jennifer was there um, saying like, 
can't believe you thought you were good enough to come to my party. And oh, then, uh, wow. wow. That same guy, Justin, was the one that, that I don't know why he had it out for me, but he just did. And he was the one that organized the whole thing, came up with the idea. Wow. One of his friends said, you're worthless. And he said, you should just kill yourself. And so at 13 years old, that was like a huge battle where I went into the spiraling depression, um, hated myself, believed I was worthless. Uh, and I don't know if it, I, I don't know why I got so deep into this so quick with the, the, <laughs> oh, the, no, the bullying no, part. Good. No, yeah, I love yeah. it because, you know, it talk about back history. We talk a lot about how uh, God, we just did an episode recently about childhood and how much this really shapes who we yeah. are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's it's something that uh, makes you the man you are. So I'm really yeah. interested to hear how this changed you for good. Yeah, well, I guess how it changed me for good. Just a little foreshadowing, I guess, is it made me a much more compassionate uh, person, I believe. Like whenever I mean, I sat at the lunch table by myself pelt in the back of the head with chocolate milk spit wads. I, 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 and then now, you know, seeing people when they're down and out or, uh, when they feel alone, you know, I try to reach out, try to do something because that's what I needed. That's what I wanted. And what, that's what my wrestling coaches actually did for me. Um, and I guess three weeks after that, that party, um, uh, I went to this uh, flea market. It's called Trader's Village. It's huge uh, in Texas. And I went out and I was going to buy a BB gun. But on the walk, I uh, I found a used VHS tape shop and uh, stopped in there. And I found UFC 2 through 9. And uh, I, I bought that. That's what I wanted uh, to get. I, I looked at the cover and I what, what I guess first or initially drew me to it was um, I loved watching like martial arts movies and blood sport and all this different oh, stuff. Classic. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But whenever I looked at it, I just thought these guys, these guys don't get bullied. Um, mm. These guys uh, are, know how to stand up for themselves um, or just look like you guys look and no one's probably just going to come up and try to pick a fight um, or just pick on you. So I was drawn to that, but then deeper uh, what, kept me intrigued was the the human chess match of it just how it combined the olympic sports of wrestling and judo and boxing and then this new thing called brazilian jiu-jitsu and whoa there's guys that are from sumo trying it out and i mean just mm. all this craziness and uh yeah i i, I bought up those nine and uh, my parents are pretty conservative and i had the uh the vhs tapes under my bed i had to hide them my dad found them he thought it was a stack of porn <laughs> uh, he was, was disappointed yeah <laughs> oh man yeah. oh man he's looking at fighting yeah I, it might have been worse. I think it was what he says because he's uh, like he took it to my mom. He's gonna try this one day, and I was like, no, I won't. But just in the back of my mind, I was like, that's my dream. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 At this, you're what? That. You're 13, 14. You say around this time? 13 years old, right okay. then. Yeah. Who was your favorite fighter? Like who? Who did you identify with? Um, at that time, I loved uh, several guys, um, but there was like Dan Henderson, who's I was oh, just retired. Badass, uh, yeah. yeah, but he's been fighting forever. Uh, Randy Couture. There was. Uh, Don Fry at that time. There was. Oh, you love uh, the American Kerr. wrestlers. Yeah, I yeah, did. yeah. I did because that was something that I saw around. Like, uh, well, I, I noticed early on. Well, obviously, Hoist was was mm -hmm. incredible. So that was really really cool. But I didn't know where I could get Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. There was nowhere mm -hmm. like that at that time. And so, uh, but then there was this wave of wrestlers that were coming in and they were just able to dominate. If a guy was a stand up guy, they could take him to the ground. He no longer could use his punches. Mm -hmm. If the guy was a hoist Gracie and he was great on the ground, they could keep it on their feet and outbox the guy mm -hmm. or just grind on him and pound on him. And so I, I love that, like the smashing machine, Mark Kerr. Oh, yeah. I, remember <laughs> I remember that documentary. On yeah. That. Oh, isn't that crazy? That was brutal. Yeah. yeah. Brutal. Um, brutal to see what, what, and I, I loved that documentary in, uh, in high school. And then he had a lot of uh, addictions to opiates and everything else. And I fell right into that, too. Did you really? Uh, yeah, big time for six years. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, anyways, I, I'm kind of going all over the place. But that's where I found my dream of fighting, though, is like getting bullied growing up that way, being the last kid in America, I think, with a chili bowl haircut. So when did you actually <laughs> start? So at this age right now, you're seeing it. It's kind of more a, a fantasy or a dream. When did you start taking action and, and start wrestling? Start When did that start happening? Yeah, so at 15 years old, uh, I got transferred out of the schools that I was at because of the bullying got so bad. Uh, even oh, freshman yeah. year, I was there. And uh, my parents decided to, you know, hey, we need to take them out of this school and public school. Let's try to put them in a private school and uh, it has good athletics. He could try to focus on something. And uh, they were the state championship football team, which my dad loved football. And he was like, hey, get in there. Maybe you can go to college playing football. Um, but whenever I went there, they had wrestling. I had already started wrestling uh, a year, but I was the only kid at my high school that was doing it because it wasn't very big in Texas. 
And but the coaches at Bishop Lynch High School were Kenny Monday and Kendall Cross, which they're both Olympic gold medalists. Mm. Kenny just coached me in my last uh, few fights. Oh, too. did he really? So, cool. Yeah, it's just so cool that he was there and learning from him. I mean, after one year of wrestling, um, but then learning from him, you don't develop very many bad habits whenever he's your coach and your training partner. <laughs> um, he just doesn't allow you, uh, so you to do the wrong thing. So you get good quick. And uh, uh, after a couple of years wrestling with him, I was a national champ. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah, so he just told me set my goals high write them down, put them somewhere you can see them. And, uh, and since that was my, my outlet, that was the thing that I had. The only thing that I really felt was building up that self-esteem or self-worth, mm. self-confidence. So you, you felt very empowered. Oh, without from, a doubt. Do you remember? So, you know, do you remember that transition of, of starting to feel empowered and feeling good about yourself? Cause I can imagine from what you started this off with, like, how much that wore on you as a child, especially that age, man. That age is yeah, so yeah, rough for kids. Yeah. Um, I actually t- uh, took a year out of school from being bullied. It was in my eighth grade year. I was oh, wow. I was a kid who moved to uh, from California to Colorado. In Colorado, mm. I was, you know, they were calling me all kinds of racist names and throwing snowballs at me. And I used to always get along with people, and it was just really rough for me. And yeah. I had to get homeschooled, and I remember how uh, impressionable that was. At what point did you feel like the shift, like you like got a hold of it and started to use it to like motivate you? And when, when do you remember that transition? Man, I, I know it sounds goofy, but I think there was a transition whenever I first found those tapes, yeah. uh, UFC mm-hmm. tapes. Like the, if these guys could do it and I'm young right now, if I start now. Um, so I was already trying to wrestle around with the very few friends that I had, like two guys, um, Sam and Max are brothers. And, uh, and we would start wrestling around at their house. Cause that's the only place we could watch the, the UFC tapes. And, uh, and I, I just was like, man, uh, I, I, I might be able to do this. And then once I had those coaches, um, and then whenever the kids at school started noticing the coaches coming to lunch and coming to check in on me and, and, and then the team that I was with, they had all wrestled in there. Uh, kind of kids program. So they had been wrestling their whole lives under these coaches. But then I came in and I was just coachable. Um, I, I listened, I wanted to learn. Um, and whenever that happened, I, I, in the first year and a half of wrestling that I wrestled, I won one match by one point. And so I wasn't very good. <laughs> but then whenever I got underneath these coaches and, and, and they believed in me, it started having me believe in myself. Um, they're like, Hey, you're a good kid. You've had a tough time. Um, but just stick with it, you know? And, uh, and once I started, I, I remember w- there was this one tournament where I went from the zero matches or sorry, one match that I won by one point. Then I went in there and they're like, look, you're hesitating. Um, you're, you're a little timid out there on the mat and yeah, you're going against guys that have a lot more experience. And we were up in Oklahoma where these kids wrestled all the time. And, uh, they're like, Hey, just get on the mat and just try it. You know, they, they were beating in one move, which uh, is that lateral drop Mm -hmm. um, throw. And uh, they were just pounding that in me, you know, you need one move and let's do that move uh, a thousand times. Uh, I think it's even a Bruce Lee quote. I'm going to slaughter it, but you know, have one move that you do a thousand or 10,000 times. Yeah, I fear the man that knows what, that practices a punch a thousand times versus the man who practices a thousand punches one time. One time. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So they were saying, hey, just be basic, but be aggressive. Get out there and just just do your thing. Just let it go. And at least if you tried, you know, you weren't hesitant, mm-hmm. uh, you weren't timid. If they beat you because they were better, then that's okay. But but don't let them beat you because you didn't try or you hesitated or you held back. You know, go out there and just let it go. Good advice. And uh, so I did that. That one tournament in Oklahoma, I was the only Texan there, and I just threw every guy to their back and pinned them all. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> it was like, wow, awesome. it just kind of clicked, you yeah. know? And it was like, hey, if you go out there and you try, you put yourself out there, you take a risk, um, those those times can pay off. Now, mm. Now, meeting you now and knowing what you're doing now, you are a very kind, uh, empathetic, like gentle, like you're a big dude. You're a massive dude, but very gentle, kind individual. And that's the, that's the energy you give off. Were you, when you were first started wrestling and fighting, were you I was the, same the same way question. or were you yeah. motivated by like, like anger, anger through a spell of rage? Yeah. Like yeah. I need to get this out and fight these people and beat them because of that, or, or were you like this? Um, I would say I was more like this in the training room uh, beforehand and after, um, but my coaches beat it in me that, you know, if you're going to be a competitor, you know, find what's going to make you tick, what's going to give you motivation. Um, they would always, I mean, in high school, they were taking us through visualization drills that mm. they learned from sports psychologists at the Olympic Training Center. Um, 
And yeah, but whenever I got out there to compete, it was, uh, I mean, that's just the wrestling mentality. Sure. You go out there to beat them down, uh, to break them. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you have, cause they're trying to break you and then, uh, you got to give them more reasons to quit than they're giving you. And, uh, so that, that, that would be the motivation behind it. But I would say there was times that, uh, that I, I always felt like I needed to prove myself, um, especially being the Texan that started wrestling his sophomore year, um, needing to, needing to go out there against these other guys that grew up wrestling or I'm wrestling guys that they're dads or NCAA champions or Olympians and different things like that. And they're their coach. And so, uh, going out there and wrestling guys always kind of being the underdog, um, always having to, to try to prove that, but then having those guys behind me, that gave me so much confidence. Like Mm -hmm. these guys have been there, they've done it. Um, and so, yeah, I'd go out there trying to prove a point. Um, and yeah, it was pretty cool to go from sophomore year, starting wrestling really, uh, to then or summer before, and then, you know, winning a couple national championships. How'd you make the transition to MMA from there? So I went to the Olympic training center right out of high school. I was recruited to Iowa state, Oklahoma state, all those schools. And, uh, and I went, I decided I wanted to do Greco-Roman wrestling, which is, uh, the NCAA style isn't done at the Olympic level. And so, uh, I was recruited out of high school to there, uh, one of the two guys and went there, lived for a year. Um, and then I, well, you can see this, I broke that elbow and, oh, yeah, uh, there you go. I, I tore, that's where the addictions happen with opiates. Mm. And, uh, I, um, man, it broke, dislocated. I tore the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, and then they tried to send me to a, mainly a knee and ankle doctor to get the elbow surgery. So I had to wait for four months arguing with the insurance company, having the doctor there sending to me a uh, petition, write letters and say like, Hey, I'm a knee and ankle doctor. This guy, <laughs> if he's going to compete, uh, maybe trying to represent the U S or be a professional athlete. He needs an elbow doctor to do his elbow surgery. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. And yeah, so I had to wait for four months and the whole time they put me on oxy uh, because it was completely torn, the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, and so, yeah, so that surgery uh, was tough. That's where those addictions happened. But then after that, uh, I guess what I was going to tell you, though, the 30, they told me I had a 30 to 35% chance of competing again. So because of that, I decided um, MMA was an outlet for the wrestlers that, uh, you know, at the Olympic Training Center, I had a coach that stepped away uh, to work at Home Depot, but he was an Olympian. He was a world uh, medalist Mm. and he couldn't make enough to support his family as a coach. So he had to go work there, which isn't, I mean, there's nothing bad about that, but that's, he is one of the best at his trade Mm. and, um, and it was better for him to step out of that uh, to be able to provide for his family doing a job that he didn't necessarily want to do. So fighting as a professional uh, sport and that being my childhood dream, I jumped into it at 19 years old after that surgery took and I knew I was going to be able to compete again. Um, yeah, I started fighting at 19. Wow. Justin, can we can I back you up a little bit? And it, are you okay with getting into a little bit of the opiate addiction? I've yeah, I went through the same thing when I had my first. I'd never broken a bone, never tore anything, never had an issue before. I tore my ACL and MCL, and uh, when I've never had, I was a total clean kid growing up. Never really did drugs, so never even thought I would be somebody who could get addicted to something. And uh, I remember the doctor telling me, oh, you know, stay ahead of the pain. Take one more, take one more. And before yeah. I know it, I was up to about seven Vicodin in a day. And then yeah. when I thought I would, didn't need them anymore, I thought I'd just cut cold turkey. And then I experienced that feeling. Yeah. And uh, so I have a lot of compassion with people that go through it. And I also feel like it's a great thing to share with, with others because I know there's a lot of people out there that battle this. Yeah. No, man, it was the toughest uh depression and the addictions were yeah the two biggest battles of my life for sure. Um, and the addictions, I mean, it was, so when I started taking them and whenever the, uh, I was told you have a 30, 35% chance of competing again. Oh, wow. uh, I, I felt like that childhood dream was never even going to get started to be a fighter. God, God, Um, the adversity you went through, you finally get fucking rolling. And then that gets, someone tells you that. Yeah. It must've been rough. Yeah. And then they gave me the pills. Well, I went into the depression knowing that, I mean, spiraling down again, I had kind of pulled myself out of it by the hard work and accomplishments and wrestling. Um, And then to know that, that the only thing that was giving me significance and value and worth in my life or a sense of that uh, was wrestling, was fighting. um, And that, that might be taken away. Um, I, I needed the pills for the, the injury, I guess. Um, at least that's what I was told by the doctors. And, uh, and I did need something to help. Um, but I liked it and enjoyed it 
uh, because it was numbing that depression side of me. Mm. And so, uh, and I loved that because I could just kind of erase and wipe mm-hmm. and Vicodin. Yeah, for sure. And then being able to get Oxy from, it turned into three different doctors in three different States. Um, cause I was in Colorado, I was going to Iowa uh, a lot to wrestle and then Texas to see family. So I was able to go and get, you know, 120 from this guy, 90 from this guy and 60 from this guy. Uh, cause they didn't communicate across state lines at that time. Mm. And so, um, yeah. And then whenever that ran out, I was going and getting it from anywhere I could find it and turned into, man, I remember the six to eight week long binge, um, that I don't really remember anything. There was a hazy memory of me hitchhiking in the mountains of Colorado. Wow. Um, uh, and then I had, um, my best friend call, and he said uh, on the voicemail, I can't believe, and I, was, I had missed it like a few days earlier. Um, and this kind of scared me sober or something, sober up a little bit. Uh, but he said, I can't believe you missed my wedding. I can't believe that my best man didn't show up. And oh, man, shit. Yeah, bro. That, that, that oh, wrecked shit. me. It, it was, uh, how do I say it? Like, it, I was this hurt dude that just kept hurting people that only love me mm-hmm. mm. um and I, this was as i was a professional i think this was actually after the ultimate fighter tv show when that happened um which i got on at 21 i was the youngest heavyweight there and everything um it, so everything looks like it was going well uh from the outside looking in the reporters you know you're the youngest guy in the division youngest heavyweight that they've signed um you're doing well you have these accomplishments behind you um but internally like i was I was at war, you know, there was, uh, it was the darkest time of my life being mm-hmm. in front of the most lights and cameras and all that stuff. Crazy how people perceive of. things just because we see you on TV and see mm-hmm. those things and we have no idea what's really going on inside yeah. and behind. Yeah. That, that, that I could sober up hopefully, uh, at least part of the time, six to eight weeks before my fight, just to buckle down and hopefully not, uh, you know, pop on the drug test. Um, but then it turned into me using, you know, two days before the fight and everything else. And if they would have tested me, I would have failed for sure. And, um, and yeah, needing that, needing that, like, I didn't just want it anymore mentally or uh, like I, I physically needed it. If that mm-hmm. makes sense, mm-hmm. that addiction that you mm-hmm. know of. Yeah. yeah. So it was brutal, man. It was, it was, my mom broke into my house when I was missing before and she found, uh, you know, the Coke and, and, uh, just bottles everywhere and, uh, and a loaded gun. And she was just, you know, terrified. Um, and, uh, one time they thought I was overdosing and, uh, uh, just like I had woke up, I had this like heat wave that came over me and this cold rush right after it. And I was just, you know, a guy's cup in the back of my head and he's saying, Justin, you got to drink, you got to drink. And he's giving me this water to just crush, you know, the bottle in my mouth and half of it, half of it probably didn't even go in my mouth, you know, it just went all over. And I look at him I'm like, who, you know, who, where am I? Who are you? He goes, who am I? You've been sleeping on my couch, eating my food. Like, I don't know if you said a week or what, but I mean, I'd been there living with this guy. Didn't even know it. Um, look around, scary place, scary house. I mean, not, not scary people, but, but people that were doing scary stuff, uh, around. And so it was tough, man. The addictions got really, really bad. And I'm just incredibly, fortunate grateful that i was able to come on the other side of it because well, i know so many how did you do that yeah do you remember do you remember one how high you got up to like how many oxycontins and vicodin and then do you remember the transition out and what that process was like yeah i mean it got it got real bad to where i got um to where i was even going to training <laughs> and i would uh i mean it's sparring days um and i'm i was at grudge training center at the time we had like shane carwin nate marquardt uh, rashad was there all the time uh, gsp would come through george st pierre all mm-hmm. the time um and we had this kind of working relationship with tristar in canada and jackson uh greg jackson's camp and albuquerque and so i mean like two or three of the best teams in the world at that time um and i could be there for my training camps and people would help me train and then whenever it was done uh, and I wouldn't even show up a lot for my training camps, but whenever my training camp was over, I wouldn't be there for anyone that had helped me. Um, but yeah, on sparring days, I would be, you know, chugging some vodka, taking some pills, starting up my vape and, and, and going to training, uh, right after that and wow. just, uh, just being messed up, you know? Um, and it was, uh, it was tough cause I got to where th- it was 34, 32, to one, they took a team vote and I kind of came in, uh, 
late to training, uh, of course, at that time. And, um, and yeah, it just looked at me. Everyone looked at me different. Coach called me into his office and said, look, Justin, we love you. I'm the only guy that voted saying, you know, you should stay or we should get you some help or we should do something. But none of the guys want you here. Like, um, like you have to go get help. You have to, to beat this. This is a bigger fight right now. Um, and I, and I received it kind of well. I broke down, cried right there with him. This is Trevor Whitman. And, uh, and he, you know, loved me, hugged me. Um, but, you know, being sent out of there, I just felt like this was my childhood dream. Uh, I became a national champion in wrestling. I was on the Ultimate Fighters, youngest guy there, and like my childhood dream is like turned into this living nightmare. Um, and now that is being taken away from me. So it wasn't the injury; it was the addictions that were taking mm-hmm. uh, this away from me. So um, that was rough, but that was like rock bottom for me. Uh, mm-hmm. And I mean, a couple weeks before that, I missed. Uh, the wedding. And then, so this was a shorter time frame where it was like, boom, 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 mm. all, everything, just the floor fell out from beneath me. Um, yeah. And I just, I just had people that started to rally around me, one guy in specific. And, uh, and he got me going this like retreat. Um, and it was truly transform transformational went there. There's a lot of broken people that were getting healed up and, uh, and changing their lives and seeing people that had done that, um, was just really encouraging, uh, to me. And like you said, like, you're not a religious dude. I'm, I'm, I'm not either. Uh, at least I don't, I don't think so. But, um, this was one that, that, I don't know, man, they're just saying like, for me, it was, I would say, uh, this is me, my personal stuff, mm-hmm. but it's what really helped. And I just say, God loved the hell out of me. Um, and so it changed my life to where I wanted to do something bigger than just me, if that makes sense. Like I wanted to make a difference and impact, like life's not about me. Uh, how can, how can, instead of me just being a fighter and fighting against people and you're right, there was, uh, even if I tried to suppress it, there was like this rage that was to my wrestling, to my fighting, um, for sure. Where I went out there and I'm like, I'm going to punish this guy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take out all my aggression, all my anger, all my demons Mm -hmm. on this guy. God, you have so Um, much awareness. Uh, Are you a reader? Did you have a great mentor? I mean, was this just all you putting it together by yourself? I mean, because at this time you're 20 something, you're you're early twenties. Yeah. That was 23, 23 years old. And I, I've always had, uh, not always, but after I found, you know, Kenny and Kendall, I would seek out, uh, yeah, people that were a lot older and uh coaches mentors dads of kids on the wrestling team or this coach that coach i'd always try to gravitate towards someone that was doing something that i wanted to do with my life um and so even though i had all those addictions and the depression um i did have all those uh, amazing words of advice that had been you know dropped in the bucket by by so many different individuals speaking kind of life and encouragement over me um, and then during the darkest times, yeah, there's just the, these few guys that just were like, Hey, we're going to go to war with you, battle mm-hmm. with you, we're going to stand with you in this. We got your back. We're, we're in cool. front of you. We're beside yeah. you. Um, and that really, really, really helped. It sounds like you, you finally figured out or you finally uh, had compassion for yourself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a good point because, um, I think it's a lot easier to, uh, sometimes with some personality types, I think, um, to have any sort of compassion towards, it's easy to have compassion towards others mm-hmm. uh, not, not necessarily easy, but, but easier yeah. uh, than yourself. If you, if you hold yourself to a high standard, at least, uh, every small mistake you can blow out of proportion and be so critical of yourself. And that's how I was. Like if, if I lost a match and it was a stupid mistake, I would no one was going to be able to beat me up more than myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I would uh, try to learn. From it's it. interesting because had, you know, you know, I have children and I, a huge learning lesson for me with kids is like, if my kids do something, let's say they take a test and they don't get a hundred percent or they compete in something and they make a silly mistake. Uh, you know, I'll talk them and coach them through it, but I have limitless compa- compassion for them. Like, you know, look, mm-hmm. you tried hard. This is a lesson. It's not a big deal. But I never was able to do that to myself. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, having children made me realize, like, hold on a second, like, why not? Like, I should be able to love myself the same way I love these children. And what I found was being compassionate to myself in that same pure way made me a better person and made my compassion for others mm. more pure, you know, coming from, a, from an even better place. Because it's coming from my own, from me being pure, me being whole. Right. You know? That's um, a great point. So... <clears throat> 
I want to talk now about your, you know, what you're doing now, your purpose now, you know, your, your, your fight for the forgotten. Hmm. What, let's go into that because a lot of our audience isn't familiar with, uh, with, with that whole story and what you're doing now. Like, how did you go from... Well, how, yeah, how close yeah. are you to getting there right now? Like, it sounds like you're starting to make this transition, that there's a greater purpose for you there. Yeah. Right. Was this part of that, that sort of retreat that you went to? Yeah. And it, it started there, there, and 11 months later, I went to the Congo for the first time, which would become Fight for the Forgotten. So after that experience, um, and after that transition... In my life, I, I actually stopped fighting for a year. I said I was going to put it on the shelf. This is my job. This is my passion. But I need, I need to, to take a break. I need to focus on myself, build up a life um, and a foundation I can stand on. Uh, and it was, but part of that was okay. If I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get involved. I'm just gonna try to do something. Like I don't have, I don't have any experience um, or or college education that that had said, you can do this or that. But I started to volunteer at the local um, homeless shelter. And then I became an official volunteer and went through all the training at the children's hospital. And uh, Now, why pick all that? Why pick volunteering? Man, I think that I had, um, one, like people helped me and I just wanted to mm. help some somebody else. Um, and two, I knew that by, or at least it, it, it was a positive focus. Um, I wasn't in the gym doing what I love, so I needed to fill it with something that I could love equally, um, or be as passionate about. And man, just seeing some of the stuff, seeing some of the rewards, uh, that come out of uh, helping one guy, uh, you know, in the shelter that, that it was his first night of homelessness ever. Um, but introducing him to the guy that ran the place. Um, and then it turned out that uh, I won't go into too many details, but he had, HIV and he had found out he had HIV or that his wife was cheating on him whenever she, he found out he had HIV mm. um, because he had been married and never had cheated on or anything like that. And then all of a sudden he comes down with HIV. So it just wrecked him. Fuck. His wife had died. <sighs> um, he had lost basically everything. Um, and just to know that, that reaching out to this guy, listening to him, learning his story, um, just caring kind of about him, caring enough to listen um, and then knowing that I could introduce him to Matt, this guy's name was Stan, introduced him to Matt. And then uh, Matt was like, you know what, there's a program we got. Uh, let me introduce you to these people. Um, and now, you know, uh, as of uh, as of a couple years ago, I know that this happened like six years ago. But as of like two years ago, I know that he was leading a group and had his own apartment and was leading a group of other people that were transitioning out of homelessness that had HIV. Wow. To see him like go from that place of rock bottom to then coming out and actually using it to, to help others. Um, and so seeing stories like that and seeing you just a little connection, I didn't do much there. All I did was, Hey, Stan, meet Matt, mm -hmm. like this, Matt, this is Stan's story, you know, and he only spent one night on the street. Um, and no, anyway, so it was just really cool to see stuff like that happen. And as I was helping others, it was continuing to help me, uh, on my path to never become that dude again. That mm -hmm. was, uh, that was, it was just undependable, unreliable, battling suicidal thoughts and depression and, and all that. So, um, yeah, but I started locally. Then I started doing stuff a little bit like nationally every now and then. And then I wanted to make one trip a year internationally and try to make a difference. Um, I didn't realize that, that that's not the best uh, way to do it. And, uh, really like the, the whole show up, blow up and blow out technique or go somewhere to a foreign land, a country you don't know, and a culture and people you don't know. And to come in there acting like you know the answer to their problems um, is, I think, a lot of ways. It it's, comes from a good place and good intentions. But naive. But naive, uh, even arrogant sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, we're, we're from here and we have this. So we're going to, because you don't, like, I don't know. There's like a little underlying mm. thing of like, uh, like, we're so much better off. So right. let us do this for you. It's also not empowering. Yeah, not empowering at all. I, I and, and so my goal after my first trip to Congo was, um, was man, I saw the negative impact of charity. Um, and, oh, wow. and it was like, man, like opportunity is better than charity. Yes. Like, how do we, mm -hmm. how do we create opportunities for people there? And, and how do we have low impact? And, and uh, there was a book that was called when helping hurts, um, really great book. There's a documentary out now on Netflix. It's called a uh, poverty Inc. Um, and it shows the the incredibly negative, tragic, or just um, 
Oh, detrimental impact that foreign aid has uh, oh, wow. and, and even creates more poverty um, in, in so many ways. Whenever you come in and you give handouts uh, of free clothes, the people there that are tailors or that have a clothing shop or that repair, you know, this, or you come in and give away a ton of free shoes, well, the local cobbler there or the guy that's build, making shoes in country. You just put his ass out of business. Yeah, out of business because those guys aren't living month to month or week to week. They're living day by day. Um, and so you gotta, you gotta slow down. Hmm. God, nobody really your, thinks yeah. about shit like that. It's well, just this air shows you how self and, yeah. and we just, we want to give cause it yeah. makes us feel well, good. It's right? great. I mean, yeah. it's a great heart, but, but, but you really got to have a heart for the people first mm-hmm. and that'll be a, uh, a, a, at least a positive, uh, impact uh, even whenever you leave. Um, and so a lot of times, I mean, I was there in Uganda when this, uh, is outside of Jinja. I won't use the, the community's name cause it's almost a slum. I mean, it's, it's one of the worst slums in Uganda. Um, but it's become a, almost a tourist attraction because there's so many people that go from the West there and they want to go to the poorest place possible. It's easier to get in Uganda. Uh, there's, it's, it's a little more comfortable there. Um, not in the slums, but, uh, they give slum tours, uh, because the locals are like, you know what? Like, uh, um, like they're doing it for the safaris, for the lions and the, the, the giraffes and the gorillas, like, like, but people want to come and see these people. So we're going to charge them for it. And then some people that have done that are saying that they're actually going to use it for something good in the community, the money that they make from it. But still it's like, it's exploiting people. Wow. Um, and yeah, so anyways, I, I kind of skipped a little bit ahead, but, but going the first time and meeting, uh, the pygmies who have now become second family. How did you meet them? How did that happen? Uh, so I went with a buddy of mine. Um, this but, is in the Congo. Yeah, this is in the Congo. Okay. And when you went, what was like, was your intention? I'm going to look for this or I'm looking, or did you, did you come about this? Like, how did that happen? Like, what was the, um, that's a question I get a lot and I'm starting to become more comfortable answering it because, uh, I sound, I feel like I sound crazy whenever I say how I went there for the first time, but I'll just, sounds like serendipitous story. Yeah, hmm. it was, I wasn't even looking for it. It wasn't on my radar. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I had never thought I would go to Africa. Like I thought, um, at this time I hadn't thought the, the let's do something locally and let's do something internationally sometimes. Uh, but just having a platform from fighting, I thought let's use that platform for good. Um, but really it was only in my radar. Hey, help people around you. Like you need to help people around you before you go anywhere else and help anyone else. Um, but man, about 10, 11 months into that life change, I just found myself in a moment and this is just me personally, but just, I prayed like, you know, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Like, cause I, at that time I was like helping, 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 but there was no direction and what I was doing. Um, but I really did want to make an impact. And I just, and dude, I had this vision. I sound nuts because I experienced with a ton of psychedelics and, <laughs> um, and, and, but this was not, uh, a, I wasn't tripping out. Like I had a movie in my mind and it was like, and I told you guys earlier that like we would practice visualization tons. You want to see the match in your mind a hundred times before you get out there and you do it. Um, but this was like effortless. And I saw myself in a rainforest and I was walking down a footpath and I, uh, I'm walking, walk, and then I hear this drumming, and then I get closer, I hear this singing, and I get into this village, and I don't know who they are, but I see this suffering that, like, I see ribs poking out, and I know that they're hungry, and that they're sick, and that wow. they're poor, and that they're, um, that they're thirsty, they don't have clean water, and I knew that they were hated or oppressed, and even enslaved, and uh, I know this sounds nuts, man, but, uh, but, and then I just felt like they felt so forgotten, like, like, as people, and... Um, I came out of that vision crying like a, like a madman, like, or just hyper, like, mm. <laughs> like hyperventilating. I left a puddle of tears. This, this, I was on like my hands and knees just wow. crying. And, um, and I kind of sat and chewed on it for like three days. I thought I'm never going to tell anyone this story. Like, did it just like, come uh, to you? Yeah. I, and I, I, wow. I don't know. I like, I, I didn't try to conjure up anything. Um, I was just in this place where I was like, I was by myself and I kind of had this, I was just in a room and thinking and just like, what am I going to do with my life? And I was, so I was really trying to think about that. And I kind of said that prayer, God, what do you do with my life? And then boom. And it was like, I don't know how to really explain it, like why it happened. Um, but I told someone three days later, it was my buddy, Caleb, who I found out, uh, 
actually I just met him uh, that day, but he, he, I ends up, people are telling me about this guy and he's kind of friends with Bear Grylls and he's a survivalist kind of guy and he goes around the world and does this and that. And so I'm like, ah, oh, well, I wrote this vision down, like at the top said forgotten. And then there's like, you know, a couple of things from the vision on there. And I went up to him and like, Hey man, I know this is going to sound crazy, but, uh, but this is something that, that just happened to me. And you seem like a dude, like the only dude I'd probably tell. And if I never see you again, it's all right. <laughs> I'm the crazy guy. Um, and he got excited. He kind of wow. leaned in and was nodding his head. And all of a sudden I'm like, what, like, what's going on? Like, like what? Cause he just looked jazzed up about it. And, uh, which was threw me off. I thought he was gonna think I was an absolute nut. And he goes, those are the pygmies. And I wow. Said, <laughs> I'm like, I'm kind of dumbfounded. Uh, like looking at him. I'm like, who is there in the Congo? Wow. And I'm just like, where, I don't know what, where the Congo is. And, uh, he goes, I went there last year and I met him and, uh, and I was just traveling through, met him for a day and I'm planning a trip back. I have my plane tickets. I'm going in three and a half weeks. No fucking way. Man. And, man, and I'm leading a team of three other guys are just doing a scout trip, going there to see how we can help them. Just going to meet them and, and live like they live. Uh, to see if there's any way that we can make a difference there. Um, and then he said, but those three guys uh, are one just texts me that he's pulling out. Uh, he's not going to come. Uh, the rebels had taken over the airport they were supposed to fly into. Um, and it was real dangerous. And the state department said Americans like no way don't travel there at all for any reason. Um, and he's like, look, but if you have, if you had a vision about this and like, I'm telling you, those are the people from that vision. You're saying they're forgotten. Like, you come meet them because yeah, they're the forgotten people. And, uh, so I was like, what? And they told me how crazy it was dangerous. Even at the time there was the United Nations had just confirmed like 30 something counts of cannibalism against the pygmies Whoa. that the rebel groups were actually hunting them, killing them, cooking them, eating them. Oh my God. Uh, that still happens in the world. That's so yeah, crazy. Isn't that nuts, bro. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, about 34 kilometers from one of the last wells that, that I drilled during the year that I was there. Um, uh, there was a rebel group called the Mai Mai that would wear uh, belts that had um, pygmy skulls on them. Oh, uh, and God. they would drink from them before they go into battle. Wow. Oh, and uh, thinking that it makes them, I don't know what this word would be, but it's uh, basically invincible or, or where the where the bullets fly right through you. So mm -hmm. it's not invisible, but uh, the bullets go through mm -hmm. you. Have you seen, like um, physically seen that? I've seen pictures, man, where people came up to me mm. showing me on their phone, like, here's a child soldier that's holding a human heart and he's got like red chin, you know, from, from biting into it. And, uh, Unbelievable. Oh my and yeah, so I've seen some crazy stuff there and heard some terrible stories and had poachers come up and trying to s sell me okapi meat and, uh, uh, or okapi. Have you guys ever heard of that no. animal? It's, it's, it's only in the Congo and it's, they're, they're almost in extinct, uh, but it looks like a horse or an antelope body uh, with a butt of a zebra in the mm. head of a giraffe. Mm. Um, and so it's the only, only other animal in the giraffe a day or giraffe family. Um, but yeah, it's got the butt of a zebra and the body of kind of an, ooh, crazy looking animal. Um, but yeah, people come up trying to sell me rhino horns and elephant ivory and different stuff like that. Um, so it's just a wild uh, place, 38 different warring rebel groups in the East. Uh, there's a new study, a failed state study saying Congo shouldn't even be called a, uh, a failed state. It should be the only country classified as a non-state. Uh, it's just the wild, wild west, like whatever wow. rebel group in the area that that's what rules. And, uh, so it's a crazy place. My first time going like, this is, the, I guess to close up that going back a little bit to that vision story, like the thing, the thing that blew my mind the most and that got me to say, just completely changed my life. Like it, it changed me from basically like the, the, the inside out where I was like, I was going this course in my life and it just a complete 180 okay i'm going to dedicate my life to this mm. because we get there and uh it's caleb me and a guy named colin who took the picture on the the cover there and um and we're walking down a footpath in the forest and then there's some drumming and then there's some singing Fuck. and we get Holy in we meet these you people. must have got like chills uh, so oh so goodness. much so to where i like i went into like a squatting position like el elbows on my knees and just hands on my face. And, uh, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, like I saw like prophetic, this like yeah. three and a half weeks earlier. And, uh, and they're like, this is your vision, you know, Caleb and Colin. I'm like, this is nuts. Like, this is crazy. On the last day though, there, there was some wild stuff that happened while there's so much corruption and so much heartbreak, um, meeting people that are suffering in ways that like you didn't even know that weren't even on your radar. 
uh, before seeing people drink from this like mossy moss covered green filth and moving it out of the way with their hands or sticks and filling up a jerry can and having to go the average woman's walk uh is 3.7 uh miles um round trip and they do that not just one time a day but two or three times a day and they have a 20 liter jerry can which is five gallons which is 44 pounds when completely full and so they're doing these water walks two, three times a day. Like that's their girls can't go to school because it's um, they need help with them collecting water. Wow. Even if they had the funds to send them to a school, which you have to pay the school fees in Africa, or at least in Congo for sure, there aren't public schools. Um, they can't send some of their kids. They have to pick and choose who, which one of the kids is special enough to go to school because the other ones need to go collect water. And then seeing kids that are dying from it or dying slowly of it. Um, it just uh, completely wrecked me. And then the chief pulled me to the side and this was kind of the, the whole, the, I don't know, the, the peak of this vision part or story where he pulls me aside and I'm like, I was the last day and I'm like, what am, what am I actually going to do here though? Like this problem. Yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah. It's gotta be overwhelming. Yeah, the insurmountable odds and suffering that I, I, I don't understand. I've never been through it and I don't know any way to help them. How do we, help? they need mm. land cause they don't have any that they own for themselves, uh, for the pygmies. And they're the first people of Congo, but they've been so oppressed and thought to be half man, half animal, even said so by the government and different stuff. Wow. Um, and like, how, how do you, how do you fight for these people whenever like, it seems like no one is, um, and when they try to stand up, they just get smashed back down. And in the animal part, like 1902 to 1906, we put a Mabuti pygmy. Uh, we brought him here with the St. Louis World Fair. Um, but then 1904 to 1906, Otabinga from the Ituri rainforest where I've gone and lived. Um, they went there, took him from his family, massacred his family. And they put him in the monkey house mm -hmm. at the Bronx Zoo um, to live with the monkeys. And they fed him bananas. And that, that's here uh, in the U.S. Like we did that 19, in the 1900s. But it's like the mindset there a lot is is uh, some way stuck back there when they don't have electricity and they don't have running water. And they're, they're living in these ways and a lot of primitive ways um, that they still think of them as half man, half animal. I'm like, what do you do? What do you even do with this? And I felt like I can't. I can't make a difference. Like, can't, where I could, do you start? I could, I could spend my whole life and it'll be maybe a drop in the ocean that I made a difference. Mm. And, uh, but no, the chief came up and pulled me to the side and it just reminded me of that vision because he's like, look, um, we don't have a voice. Can you help us have one? And then I kind of was like, man, I have this platform. And then he said, look, everyone else calls us the forest people, but we call ourselves the forgotten. And since he said forgotten, and I had wrote that at the top of that paper, God damn, for that crazy. vision, yeah. when he said forgotten, Caleb grabbed my shoulder and like my eyes started kind of welling up with tears. And, uh, I'm just like, man, I got to do something. Second trip. Um, I had a one and a half year old that introduced me to the world's water crisis in a brutal way. Uh, his name's Andy Bo and he actually passed away and I was holding him and it just wrecked me, just ripped my heart apart, you know, tore me open seeing a little like it would be anybody um but like actually not just reading about it or not just seeing it oh that sucks that they're clearing the the moss out of the way with their hands um but actually holding the little guy or living it kind of with not living that but like i don't know but just physically being there and having your hand on the shovel digging the grave and just like feeling like man i i and flashing back to my world you know flashing back to my world where i i can take a piss in the clean water i can give it to my dog i can water my lawn with it you know there's got to be some sort of answer and solution to this problem hmm. and there's got to be a way we can put the put the tools in the hands of the people that need it the most so it there's sounds like it started be. kind of focusing like you knew like i have to do this this is my purpose yeah and that kind of focused it a little bit like, okay, water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, water's, yeah. water's got to be the, one of the, the main things thing. to work on. Yeah, and we, we, we started with land because you can't give someone water if they don't own the land. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was land, water, and food, and water was what everything hubbed around. Now, how did you get um, them land when they didn't have any? And uh, some of them were... Slaves, right? Yeah. Like, like literal slaves. Yeah. I mean, so, ex explain that. Like, what do you mean by that when you say slaves? Like, So worldwide... There's an estimated, oh, well, actually, this is a, the lower stat that I've seen now, but it's supposedly gone up in recent years. Um, there's 27 million 
God, slaves kind of on planet Earth. Unbelievable. Right now. Um, I saw that on your TED talk. That's fucking ones. insane. Isn't that nuts, yeah, bro? Twenty absolutely cr- more than ever in human history. Uh, walking the Earth, which there's a bigger population. Sure, but but um, but this is nuts. Uh, and and it's so like hidden and in the dark and mm. like um, just like the world's water crisis, where 1.5 million children every year under the age of five die just because they don't have clean water. 1.5 million, and that's like. I think 800 a day just because of diarrhea. I like actually die from diarrhea. Mm. And then 2,350 kids every day die from the malnutrition that they have from the waterborne disease because they live in places where there's normally not water. There's not an abundance of food, but the food that they do have is just running right through them. They don't, they are not able to absorb the nutrients from the food. Um, And so it was just absolutely crazy. And so with the pygmies though, the average, or so the, there's an estimated 200 to 600,000 uh, pygmies in Congo. That's the highest population of them. They're, there's some in Rwanda and Uganda and Burundi and Cameroon and Central Africa Republic, um, but the highest density uh, population is in Congo. Um, and, but pretty much all of them are, are, are enslaved uh, to some sort of degree, some by rebel groups that are throwing them down into the gold and diamond and coltan mines, which Congo is the richest country on the planet in minerals. It's where we got the uranium for the world war two bombs. It's, it's where uh, just everything. I mean, it's the richest country on the planet by far. Um, but on the human index uh, development index, they are the poorest mm-hmm. um, least developed nation. And so uh, it's just a, a wild place where, um, but the, so there's the extreme kinds of love levels of slavery, but then there's also ones where three or four generations ago it was worse. Um, and, but now their slave masters kind of take care of them in ways of like giving them the scraps of food or giving them two or three bananas for a full day's labor from sun up to sundown. Um, that's more the mild where they work for them because they don't have any land rights because they used to be able to hunt and gather and completely. So the slave, they used to have almost an upper hand, or at least it was a symbiotic relationship where the pygmies and the Makapala, the non pygmies, um, there's over 200 tribes in Congo. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just say the non pygmies that are live near them. Uh, they, uh, they were growing the corn and rice and beans and the pygmies were hunting and gathering and getting the meat, uh, and, and the rare fruits and vegetables. And they were able to come and trade, Mm -hmm. um, but eventually with deforestation taking off and the introduction of like the elect or uh, mechanized like uh, uh, chainsaws, um, it started making it basically impossible for them to trade anymore. They needed to keep all the meat they got because with, when I've been there and the trees are falling, sometimes it sounds like thunder is rolling through the forest, but there's no rain. Um, it's these trees that are falling. And so that makes the animals scared and skittish and run away to where it's really hard for them to hunt and gather and mm-hmm. provide for themselves now too, where it's basically impossible for them to sustain themselves because of how hard it is to, yeah. to hunt now nowadays. And so because of that, they may, were made even more vulnerable um, than the vulnerable p- other people living in poverty right next to them. But their slave masters now, we've seen a, a, a working relationship with 10 different villages. We've drilled 62 wells um, there for all different communities, um, but 10 uh, that we've worked with both sides, the the slave masters and the slaves, and which we'd say former now, where we worked with on the government level, the local uh, state and uh, national level to get them land back for themselves where they own it. It's not fight for the forgotten's land. It's not water for's land. Um, it's their land, which is the strongest thing in Congo courts. And so we've gotten them back 3000 uh, acres of land. Wow. And uh, what's been really great is working with both sides. So how, yeah, I was going to say, how did you get them land? How did that, how did yeah. that work out? So some came from the government, uh, but that was the smaller, actually. We wanted to truly work with the community. So we go into a community and we cast the vision. And if they catch it, where it's like, hey, we want to work with you. We want to sit down. And that's what we always do is sit down and listen. Uh, we call it Campfire University, where they take us to school um, around the campfire and and teach us everything and tell us, you know, the struggles of their community. So that way we don't have this like cookie cutter going to, into a new village and saying, oh, we already know we've been to this mm-hmm. place. So we know all the problems here in this, this place too. Um, you got to sit there and listen and learn. And uh, 
So when we do that, though, what we found is that in some of these areas where the slave masters have, it's the third or fourth generation, you know, they inherited their slaves and their families and um, they're making a dollar to a dollar 25 per day, the slave masters, <clears throat> the average, in, that's the average income uh, of 74 million people mm. in Congo. Um, and so it's, it's almost become a burden to have to have these uh, people underneath to take care of. Hmm. And so, um, but they can't take care of themselves and it's their slaves they inherited and their father owned them and their grandfather owned them. And so they own them. And it's like what a uh, crazy dynamic. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. It's so crazy that it's happening today in this world, but it's like, how can we, we call it Tamika Pomoja uh, in Swahili. How can we work together for good? And so the, but, but the good of all people, and I think that's good business, right? Everyone wins. Um, it's not about like, Hey, I'm going to get, a, you know, we're going to work out this deal, but I'm actually getting the better end of the bargain. And, and you're going to, you're going to be bitter afterwards. It's like, no, how do we do this in a way that it's win, win, win for everybody. The slave masters technically, you know, maybe losing, um, their people, but in a way that like they, have asked for now um after the first couple of villages in babofi mabakulu people were coming to us saying we want to work out the same kind of deal you guys did with them so it's all on the uh the net, the government level where everyone's signing it it's contracts it's handwritten it's typed out everyone's signatures on it and their thumbprints mm -hmm. so no one can say that they they didn't sign it um but at the same time it, when they, when we buy the land from their masters, they're benefiting financially mm -hmm. um, because they're selling the land and that's going to help their family. It's helping the pygmies because they get land and that's helping their family. Um, and then we bring in water. And so I told you guys about Andy Bo, but it also happened with a little guy named Babo and then a little girl named Siku um, that I've been part of the, the, the funerals of. And, but then I've also been to five or seven others. Um, and half of those are probably from the Makpala, the non-pygmy kids. They don't have access to clean water at all. And so they're dying of the same diseases that the pygmies are. And none of them have access to clean water. And their little girls aren't able to go to school or their wives are having to go on this two or three trips a day, uh, spending hours hauling this and their necks killing them from those water walks and their stomachs constantly filled of parasites and worms. Um, and so to know that we can come in and work together so that we buy back the land and, and, and kind of restore a, a, a good relationship among the you two people. And not that there was ever, even being the slave master, sometimes they had healthier relationships with the people. Um, it's kind of how that community worked, you know, some there, I wouldn't say they're evil people. No, the ones that are the rebel groups that are holding guns to them, that are putting them in chains. Yeah. We haven't been able to help make an impact there. Um, but where we can work with both sides, it's been, I'm making this really long, sorry, but it's, no, uh, no, no, right, man. Um, Keep going. it's, it's, uh, it's hard to kind of <clears throat> share the whole dynamic. That's why there had to be a book. That's why now there's a, a two hour, uh, feature link documentary coming out. Um, hopefully at Sundance this next year, mm. uh, telling the story and having them tell the story. So it's not like me trying to do it. It's them having their own voice, if that makes sense. And, and sharing that, you know, we had a slave master on camera crying with us saying how, uh, not, not crying, but having a tear that he wiped and, uh, saying that, um, you know, this, this helped the community so much because he ran the local clinic. He was the chief and he ran the local clinic and his hospital there, 87% on average for three years were seen at his clinic just because of waterborne disease. When we came in and we, we, uh, we lifted the burden with the land deals then of the water, that clinic the very next year was 10%. Um, so from 87% waterborne disease down to 10%. Then we brought in the wash program, water and sanitation hygiene, helped them dig latrines, put up hand washing stations. Now we're starting a soap produ production facility because they have all the raw natural materials there. But, uh, but the only thing, only soap I've ever seen sold in Congo and that people ever use is this car washing soap that's coming from either China or India, and it's packed full of chemicals. I've used it plenty of times, and it leaves your skin raw afterwards, mm. um, or at least it, it, there's like the first couple of times for sure until your body kind of gets used to it. And uh, so we're able to create jobs in that way. And so it's helping the community saying, hey, we want you guys to lead the way with this. We want to truly empower you. We want to create an opportunity. And, um, and the proof in the pudding for me was being there for a full year um, and then having to step back, step out. That was a hard step. Like, but I had to say, 
if this thing is dependent on me, it's going to fail anyways. So I need to step back and see these guys doing it for themselves. And they need to know that this is their business. This is their opportunity to do good. They own it. They run it. Um, and we're going to continue to, to pour into them, invest into them, bring the right trainers, the water, the geohydrologists, the, the, the engineers, the people to continue to teach them in their craft where they're going to get better. Um, but yeah, the next year they, we, I was there for the first 13, the next year they did 20 wells without me there. Uh, and then this last year they did 29 new water wells, um, took the number up to 62. Uh, we have 18 full-time staff. Um, it's their job to be well drillers. They spent 301 days teaching the wash program in these different communities uh, that we've drilled the wells. And now our top two guys are able to go out. They started a new team in Cameroon, which isn't even the country. Uh, it's a different country, but they went to help teach others how to drill wells in Sierra Leone um, in Malawi. And then uh, they've gone and received training from the other Water 4 teams um, because Water 4, the nonprofit Fight for the Free Islands initiative underneath, they have 375 people in the country of Africa, the, or sorry, continent of Africa, and uh, 16 different African nations uh, that are all nationals um, that are drilling wells. So over 40 well drilling teams. Last year, they drilled 690 wells, wow. um, served 172,000 people. And it was all the people in the countries serving their own countrymen instead of having to wait for us to come do it for them. So it's a, a real impact. movement that's yeah. happening. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It's been that's so great. cool. Man. Well, there's a couple of things that uh, I th really stand out to me. One is, you, you know, when you talk about how when Westerners go in and, and donate and give things like shoes and food, that they're confusing intention uh, many times for result. Mm. And, you know, in the 80s, there was a huge push to feed, uh, you know, people in the, in, the, uh, in the continent of Africa. And uh, what happened was we gave them tons and tons of food and aid. And then what the unintended consequence of it was, and of course it was all good intention, but the unintended consequence was you had then generations of people coming up who didn't know how to farm mm -hmm. and it's like became it's like the teach a man a fish thing. They became very incredibly dependent on, uh, on this aid and actually ended up in, you know, and sometimes in, in, you know, worse situations. Yeah. Um, absolutely. and the way you're doing it is very different. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the things that you're doing that's very different, which requires a tremendous amount of empathy, compassion, but also of objective intelligence is, it's easy. It would be very easy for anybody, for me, to go in and be like, slaves, slave master, slave masters, you guys are bad. Mm. You know, screw you guys. We're not working with you. We're going to help these oppressed people. And in fact, we're going to punish these mm. slave masters, which feels just feels justified. You feel like there's justice behind it. But is that really a long-term yeah, solution? Are you really accomplishing anything? Because doing that? once I leave... You know, now, like you said, you're not getting this win-win, right. and could that cause more problems? Could that cause more it. war? Right, and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think I think um, what I learned from my team is um, a team of guys there. Right, they're honestly they're so much better than I am at this, and like they're the engine, and I got to be the spark plug, and now I get to go back and kind of fill that engine back up with some fuel and, and hopefully that's encouragement and different stuff, but they, but they're the ones putting it into action and just being able to be there. And, uh, and, and, and like they said, you know, if we try to love one side and hate the other, it's only going to end up hurting the people that we're really trying to love and help. Mm -hmm. And so we got to love both sides. We got to help them both equally. They're the same community. Mm -hmm. And so how do you draw this line in between them and, and say, we're going to help you, but we're not going to help you. We're going to exclude you and we're going to include you. And so it's a, it's a really, um, I honestly think it's slower. It, it's much slower, the process. Um, but, but the impact you get to see it and you get to feel it and you get to hear it. And, um, and I'm honestly not needed for this thing anymore. Uh, I get to be a part of it. And, um, it's almost like I went, this might sound really cheesy. Uh, but it's, it feels like I went from kind of a leader in it, uh, to then now it's my job to be the cheerleader and, uh, and just cheer them on and encourage them and, uh, be like, because, because the tough thing is, is that, um, you're so right about, I think in the eighties, uh, like you're saying, um, 
there was a song I think that was the rally. Wasn't it? We are the we world. Are the world. <clears throat> Pro, it was something like that. We are the children. <clears throat> and then I think there was Great lyrics song. in that song that said, um, "Like it's where nothing ever grows, and it's where no river ever flows." And it's like that is not Africa, mm-hmm. <laughs> like at all. No. There are there's the Nile River there. There's the Congo River, the longest ones and the deepest, most powerful rivers that could, if there was a big enough like uh, electric dam inside of that thing, um, it would it would it could light up the world most likely. <laughs> but at least Congo, at least Africa, and and you drop i mean you spit a seed in the rainforest it's going to grow like it it's so fertile but the the outside aid um has impact so negatively that everywhere i walk there's you go to the market to buy rice it all says on there american made rice or Ameri- or china india then these government like uh they have these government subsidies and these big farms that like they, they get paid by the government to produce all this food to just go drop it there for free. Mm -hmm. And so what does that do to that local economy there that they, it was there, there were the farmers. What people don't sell it. What people don't realize is many times the way aid works, you know, big government aid is that it, it goes from the poor people of a rich country uh, because we get many times taxed for it. uh, For example, um, to the rich people of the poor country. Mm, so you've got absolutely. the owners of these big farms and stuff getting these massive government subsidies uh, that came from a rich country and then they give, you know, they do the free stuff and you don't have the distribution isn't as efficient or effective as when there's a market-based economy there. Right. Uh, you get a lot of people who then, there is no way to compete with that. How do you com- how do you create a business and compete with something that's free? You can't. Mm. And so it depresses uh, you know, progress in many ways. And I don't want to discourage anybody, by the way, for, for from giving to charities and stuff. Yeah. I just think it's important people see it so that we can be as effective yeah. as possible. And then you even said it like the Congo is one of the, if not the most mineral rich places mm-hmm. in the world. The problem isn't that they lack uh, resources because that's what a lot of people think. Like, oh, they just need resources. Just right. give them a bunch of resources. The problem many times is that there's just there aren't there isn't the ability to have these open markets there isn't these opportunities for people to own property and to build for themselves and what you're doing when you're teaching people how to build these wells and getting them involved is that's a spiraling effect like no, yeah, it's dude. now that you started there and it's grown no. it's only grown yeah. Yeah. on its own yeah it's got to yeah. be really exciting to see the potential or the possibilities of where this continues to go oh my goodness i mean it's been it's it's blown my mind because we went from saying, okay, we're going to go deep into the rainforest with these water wells and we need something practical and sustainable. Uh, we can't buy a $500,000 to a million dollar drilling rig and drive over these bridges that collapse so often and go over these terrible roads. They're just going to beat the, the, the vehicle beyond recognition. And, and then we can't even drive it into the rainforest. So uh, the mud or the trees are all in the way and we can't clear a road. Um, so we got to be able to hike this stuff in. And so it's all manual drilling. It's all augers and chisels and rock breakers. And it can take 10 days, 16 days uh, to complete a well. It's the hardest work I've ever been a part of. Uh, and we had, we had several guys quit at first because we weren't, we, we were in a tough geological area. Um, and we were beginners and this was like, uh, we were like white belts and this was like black belt level stuff. <laughs> and, uh, good analogy. Yeah. And so, um, anyways, it was, it, it was tough. So some guys quit on us, um, and, and finding the right people is the toughest part. Um, but there's so many good people there waiting for an opportunity because there aren't many. Um, and so you, you get those people in and people are a greatest resource with the good hearts and the good uh, in the right place, uh, in the right mindset and then empower them. Yeah. Where we just got our first mechanized rig, which we're not going to stop the manual drilling at all, but the mechanized rig uh, that came across on a river, uh, in three canoes, a $50,000, uh, drilling rig. We were like, please don't sink, please don't <laughs> sink. Um, but it, it made it safely. And now they're going to be able to go punch some 300 foot 
deep holes in the ground, um, in areas that communities are able to buy themselves. And so it's not even giving the wells away. They're looking for private contracts. So that the way they're becoming so self-sustainable that they don't need us. Um, they're already getting close to 50% self-funded in their wow. own country. Son of a bitch. Um, I love this. I yeah. Know. Oh man. And then it's going to become a, uh, so world water day, um, is March 22nd. Water four is doing this thing, uh, where, it's going to be really awesome where uh, we're building a water tower or water kiosk in this community. That's tomorrow, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> That's absolutely. Cool. Tomorrow. And, and we're doing this campaign. It's, it, we're, you know, we're trying to raise $50,000 for this uh, water tower. And the reason being is that water tower in this uh, community, one, they're drinking from the same place that they're cattle. They're, they're a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, the herd, a uh, herding tribe. And so, um, hurting and hurting, I guess. Mm. But, uh, uh, they, I mean, there's cow patties all right there in the water, right beside the water. And, uh, and the kids are getting real sick and we're going to put up this water tower. So that way they come and they buy the water. Cause I mean, water, you're paying for, everywhere. We, you use water here, you're pretty much paying for it. And so, um, there we're going to do it for like five cents or five shillings per jerry can. So for 20 liters, five gallons, you pay five cents, basically a nickel. Um, and that right there is going to go back into the community. It's going to help fund a school and it's going to help fund more wells. Mm. Um, and so we're trying to c- create these things. And we're going to do that model from Ru- after we go and do it in Rwanda, which we've already done it in Kenya, Ethiopia and Sierra Leone successfully to where those things are already uh, producing multiple wells per year. Those water kiosk to now we're going to do that in the Congo too, to where we're just trying to find every solution possible. I mean, eventually in two years from now, we're going to be doing water taps into people's homes, hopefully wow. that are close to those water towers to where they, uh, you know, to where the people that do in Africa, it's either you are incredibly, extremely rich or you are incredibly, extremely poor. There is no middle ground. And that like, I mean, it's just, it's two different worlds and spectrums. And so for those people that have, um, the money, we need to be able to say, Hey, we got us, we got an answer for you. You want to, you want uh, running water, you want a shower, you want, you know, a sink and all this, but with clean water, because the only thing they have right now, if they do have something coming in is dirty water, even the really rich people. And so, um, yeah, trying to find those solutions and say, Hey, we have this service for you, but whenever we get that, we're, we're going to do something good with it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it's just been so cool to see the team coming up with it brainstorming, casting the visions, getting in front of a big whiteboard or chalkboard and just start drawing up the big dreams and visions. What's it like working with the the governments there, the local governments and the, is it, is that, is that tough? Yes. At, well, at first, um, oh, it was so tough at first because, uh, they wanted us to pay a $1,500 tax every time we drilled a well. Um, saying that's Congo's water. It's not your water. Yeah. Leave it there. Nobody the can use it. But when you get it, yeah, you yeah. got to pay us. Yeah. How nice is that? Yeah, right? It's so nuts. Um, it's on the president, who was never even elected, um, on his agenda, water is number one. Um, I think it's only around 1% of 74 million people uh, have clean water there in Congo. Wow. And so uh, we want we want to change that. And I think that this model, we can, we can knock out the world's water crisis in our lifetime. Like we have the tools, the technology, and the people are there in the communities. They're going to be more passionate about it than I ever could be. They know the day in day out struggle. Uh, they've lost family because of it. Um, and they're, they're suffering because of it. And so, but the government, we went and had to go through some appeals and, uh, go to court and fight them. Then we got them down to $750 the next time we went to court. And then, uh, luckily we'd never paid any of these. And then, um, we went back a, a third time, had a great lawyer from, from there in the Congo. And he really fought for us hard saying, this is the president's number one agenda. Why, why? put it on the politics of it all? Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. He was so great at it. And, uh, now it went to where they dropped it down to zero. Um, and now the governor of that state in Naituri, um, he has fully backed us, sponsored us, supported us. Badass. Uh, we basically have free reign of the region. Uh, of course, the people to... love it, man. Now you got to do it, buddy, or yeah. you're going to get elected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I think he's, uh, I mean, he saw that part for sure, um, that I better sponsor this and, and stop trying to, to to take away from it. But But that's what they get used to, where whenever these big NGOs come in, 
with an unlimited amount of uh, resources and funds and Mm -hmm. um, millions or billions of dollars to spend. And then they also have a quota and donors. Like that's the number one thing on those NGOs agendas is, and I I hate to say it and hopefully it's not, uh, they have good intentions. They really want to help the people, but really they have to please the donor more than they have to please the people in the there. So they have to crank out a bunch of tally marks and Mm -hmm. uh, meet the expectations and quotas. So they don't have time to, to actually have relationships with the people. So the government, the anyone that sees those organizations coming in, they try to get whatever they can Put get their out hand of out. Them. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, uh, people don't realize just how much um, some of these people in power, these government officials, are uh, benefit from some of these foreign, you know, charities and donations mm-hmm. because they come in and they say they come in. We've got you know five million dollars to donate to whatever. Well, they're like, oh, cool. We're gonna, we're gonna get like a million of that or whatever, and then the rest we're gonna divvy up amongst some of these people in power and landowners or whatever. And um, it's it's it sucks because it's not doing what it's intended to do many times. Yeah, it's a it's a, a kind of a horrible situation. And you know, you were talking about how you know us as Americans, as wealthy Americans, when we look at these situations, when we look at these at these charities and helping these people. What and I hate to say this because we're all we all I mean, America is one of the most giving countries in the world. It just is. If you look yeah. at uh, charity, we are by far the most charitable nation on earth. Um, yep. We're also one of the wealthiest. And but I do think that there's a level of when you look at a people or a region, there's a little bit of that. I hate to use the word condescending, but almost like they can't help themselves. We're just going to take care of them Mm -hmm. because they can't do it. So poor people, let's just give you the stuff. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. Whereas you're not looking at them like that. You're looking at them saying, these are very capable, amazing people. They're not, you know, beneath me. They don't need me to just give them shit. All they need is an opportunity to do it Hmm. for themselves. And it seems to be working spectacularly. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And that's, that's, what's been, yeah, I mean, it's been so cool because, you know, m- after I found some, the first four guys on our team, uh, they were so rock solid. They were, I mean, better men than I, for sure. I look at those guys as like giants. Um, they're, they're incredible dudes. And I've learned so much and uh, and been encouraged so much. And these are guys that, you know, I was in their wedding and, uh, and they're, they're some of my best friends and my brothers and, uh, and we've gone to war together. Like how you develop these relationships with, you know, f- my fight team and training partners, we sparred together. These guys, we we've been through some really, um, tough stuff whenever I told you I was digging the grave, but I wasn't digging it alone. You know, mm-hmm. these guys were with me and, um, and, and they've lost family. I've seen, mm. met their ants that have scars all over them because they've been hacked up with machetes and actually lived to survive and tell about it. Yeah. And so they've been through so many tough stuff um, and they've risen above it. They've dug deep um, and they've overcome. And so uh, being around those people has, uh, you know, Ben, Jack, Patrick, I mean, these guys, I'm a goo, I'm a goo, which means we are one, we are not different. Mm-hmm. Um, and learning from them some incredible things that they live out. You know, they say a Swahili proverb is if you want to go fast, uh, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Mm-hmm. And so they're always wanting to include each other. And, and us here, we want to be so independent I- individuals. Um, but there, you just do life together and it's a community Um and I love that about the sports world and lifting mm-hmm. and everything else. Like there's these communities, this podcast, mm-hmm. right? There's mm-hmm. an awesome community behind mind pump. Uh, but yeah, having a community of these guys that are just, they're fighting for something so much more than themselves were, has were, been awesome. Were you ever put in some d- dangerous situations when you're, oh, yeah. I mean, cause you don't necessarily blend in. No, yeah. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm you're a, kind a, of a target. You're a really big dude with yeah. like, you know, blondish, orangish hair, big beard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, mm. you, you look like the yeah. opposite. Thor of, just came to the car. <laughs> you're like the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with this mighty rod. Yeah. 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 No, it's, uh, no, you're right. Uh, walking through the jungle, I'm sure, uh, I look like a vanilla gorilla um, <laughs> or, or I've had people think I was half literally cause we go so remote sometimes cause we want to start where it's the worst. Um, and we still are targeting there. Um, and then we come out in the community to just try to help fund more of where it's worse. Um, but yeah, I've been called half man, half lion before, <laughs> oh, wow. um, had people run and hide behind trees. Uh, oh, wow. I've had a bow and arrow drawn on me from oh, the shit. distance. No yeah. 
uh, because coming in unannounced is, is something we learned. I should, we should probably give them a heads up on <laughs> coming in there for the first time. First guy with light skin, uh, if they ever meet. Um, yeah, there's been a video that went viral that was on, uh, Jimmy Kimmel and the Today Show and stuff of, you know, the kids seeing a white guy for the first time. Um, and no, man, it's, but yeah, there's been some dangerous situations from, Rebel groups, uh, I won't get into the the situation, the instance to protect some others that were involved, but uh, um, but yeah, I was in a standoff with like seven or eight guys, and there's wow. three or four machine guns aimed at me, and uh, oh, wow. um, that was that was uh, uh, I'd say trauma, yeah, for sure, traumatizing. Was there ever a moment and, during all of this because uh, off air you talked about how you've had malaria twice and some other. You know, uh, you've gotten some other illnesses that you wouldn't you, you, you wouldn't get if you were just staying here, right? Dangerous situations, living in the Congo. At any moment, are you thinking like, man, I don't know if I can do this, or I, I think I'm done? Uh, after the first trip, um, well, during the first trip, for sure. I, that's when I was thinking, this is too too big, too tough. I can go home and live my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you then, gave that an out the mosquito analogy. I think I think is so great. Mm, absolutely. Oh, and after after having malaria actually three times now um oh. it uh it yeah it means a lot more to me now <laughs> because uh <laughs> uh that's, you, it's, you get it from a mosquito bite and uh yeah they say that if you think you're too small to make a difference try to sleep in a closed room with a mosquito yeah that's <laughs> um, a great quote yeah, I, I love it yeah i love it and it's so true because like uh, well having malaria a mosquito just a little bite um almost took my life yeah, it made that big of a difference where I lost 33 pounds in five days. Oh, shit. I was wow. vomiting at the end of it, red and green, which was blood and bile. Oh, wow. um, my esophagus was raw for like two weeks after. Uh, I lost my peripheral vision. I It sounded like I had a bee's hive in my ears. Um, like just, I don't know why, but just constantly sounded like I had a bee's hive. Mm. And uh, my s- fever would spike to 103 something and then drop to 96 and felt like I was on a rocking ship that was like spinning oh. in circles. Um, and man, I would, I would say though that after, uh, <laughs> that vision and then it actually like happening, like it was like, man, this is something I've got to do, dedicate my life to the second time though, second trip, um, being there with Andy Bowen and, and even being part of the funeral, like, uh, how do I say it? Um, here, it's so different. Like I get culture shock coming back here. Um, mm. I don't nec- I don't get it there. I am actually, I'm actually homesick for there. Oh, wow. I love it. Mm. I've spent two years there over the last five and, uh, just, just love it. Um, but, but like, it seems like rela- relationships there have so much more depth to them a lot of times. Um, and, but here, whenever death happens and it's so tough, it's so hard, um, anywhere, death is never anything pretty, but, but in a way we make it as pretty as possible because there's all the flowers and it's in a really nice place and we all get our best dress and, and, and we prepare ourselves. We try to hold everything all together whenever we go. And man, that first funeral for Andy Bo, I mean, it was, uh, it was so ugly and painful and in your face and raw and real and, um, you know, I, uh, when I was holding him, the blood came out of his ears and onto my hands and it was just like, Oh my gosh, you know, I'd never seen mm. that before. And, um, and so after that and seeing the pain and, and, and committing to them that like, I'm going to try to do something. My first promise wasn't to do land or water or food, but it was like, Hey, I, I can, I can help tell your story. Cause that was them saying, we don't have a voice. Can you help us have one? Mm-hmm. So after that, the commitments to it, I would say that the tough stuff just came with the territory mm-hmm. and it was like, at that point, you make, that's it. I'm doing it. I don't care I'm what happens. It. Now I see. I see that you have a, a a ring. Or are you yeah. married? Okay. I am, yeah. How how has your wife uh, sort of been with this whole process of you going out there and visiting? Were you married and, before you went, or is it after that you met? Uh, we met a month after my first trip. Wow. Um, mm. And our actual first conversation was about the pygmies and uh, and my trip. And I was telling her, I was thinking about this name called Fight for the Forgotten. You know, they told me they're forgotten. I felt that I knew that before. And then I'm a fighter. 
Um, so that was our first conversation and she's been completely wholeheartedly, uh, supportive ever since. And, um, because that's how it started our relationship. And she's actually lived there for three months, um, or been there for three months. Um, her first time ever camping is, uh, is pictured inside my book. Uh, it's uh, a twig and leaf hut. Um, she slept on the ground. Uh, that's her first time camping ever. period. Ever. She did it in, in wow, Africa. She went, in the, yeah. 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 She's from like <laughs> Dallas, Fort Worth city girl, uh, like inside the city. And, um, her dad tries to dispute that saying, Oh no, she grew up camping. They went, <laughs> they went camping at a campsite and a camper a couple of times and <laughs> had a TV and shower and beds inside the camper. Um, so I was like, okay, Papa bear, uh, you're right. She's been camping. <laughs> um, but, but here I'll say like, you know, she, for her first time ever camping was there in the forest, uh, with the pygmies, but, but they've fully accepted her in to adopted her in, uh, a, there's only four people I know of that they've given a, a, a Mabuti pygmy name to, um, they've given me the name Efeosa Mabuti Mangbo. And you got to say it like that. What does that mean? Efeosa was the first name given to me. And that was actually right before Andy Bo. Uh, and it means the man who loves us. Oh. And so I, I obviously Jeez. love that one. Um, mm. Made me tear up. And I wasn't that emotional of a dude until I started going and meeting and seeing, you know, it's okay. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to care. Um, and, uh, and I mean, yeah, there's, we're men. We can be tough too. Uh, you know, I still like to fight, um, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but yeah, it's okay. And, um, and Mabuti Mangbo is now my fight name, uh, translated. Uh, it used to be the Viking, um, but now it's the big pygmy. Um, oh, yeah. And so that's what everyone calls wow, me. Wow. They, they call and, you uh, one of them. Yeah. The big pygmy. Wow. So, uh, Ben, his name's Amigu Amigu, which means we are one, we're not different. And then Emily, uh, she is Lusume Kumite Li, and uh, Lusume means uh, chosen, uh, and Kumite Li means belongs here, and so mm. uh, so they they, they love her because um, because I, I think there's a difference where there's there's people that come to help and and to just give stuff away, um, and normally when that happens, they're staying in a hotel that's hours and hours away, mm -hmm. and then they wake up early and they drive out there and they come out there and they. They announce their arrival with a parade and they throw a party and they take a bunch of pictures, mm. but they never stay. Um, mm. They never uh, immerse themselves in the culture, at least there, uh, because it's extreme circumstances too. You know, like my wife's it's first night man. there. It, it is. Um, and if there, you don't have a real reason uh, or probably connection, it's not really like vacation. Right? No, it's not <laughs> vacation, man. Um, but, it, but to the people, when that happens, they say they feel like it's a human safari. When people just come in, give something and take a bunch of pictures of us and we only see them for a couple hours and they promise they'll come back, but they never do. Um, it, it's, it, it breaks trust. Um, mm. And whenever you come in there and stay like they stay, learn how to build a hut like they build, go out there and collect the leaves like they do, start putting the shingles and walls up through the you know skeleton of twigs that you, you, you make into this dome. Um, sleep on the dirt and get rained on and have uh, roaches climb on you. You have to get someone to get a black mamba out of your hut. And, uh, and, uh, wow. this, this, uh, this right there is that little kind of pinkish or whatever yeah, yeah. scar. Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, it's on my ankle. And, um, and that was a scorpion that, that got me. Uh, and you know, they got up, ran out, um, got these leaves and or herbs or whatever and pounded them up and, that little wet mortar and mm -hmm. uh, made this paste and put on me. So, because at that time I started to break out into a fever and my teeth started to chatter. Um, and they oh, put shit. that paste on there to draw out the, the poison and venom. And so like you, you, you learn and you experience and you have these stories to tell and they, they see you right there and you're almost, mm -hmm. how would I say it? Like you're on like an eye to eye mm -hmm. uh, level with them. You're not, you're not looking down at them in their situation and their poverty. You're, you're there to learn um, right. and to live with them. So. How, how much of this has changed your your relationships with people back home here now? Like, how much do you feel yourself being more mindful or more appreciative of relationships and connections? How has it changed you? Oh yeah, for sure, uh, for sure. And it's it's also made it it's made it uh, so, some relationships so incredibly valuable, and then it's made some other relationships. I don't. This might sound real callous, but but just like, hey, I want to I want to. I want to do life with people that want to do life with me, or I want to, I want to tell this story. I want to, I want to try to be mindful and share that, man, life is so much bigger than what we can get. 
Um, and, uh, and I think just throwing out another documentary that I liked, it was called minimalism, uh, that I just watched. I just watched that. You did. Yeah. Yeah. I I just watched it too. And it had so much great stuff in there. And what's, what I, what I connected that to or related it to was, man, the pygmies are, are some of the most oppressed and poorest people on planet earth. Um, they have the least, you know, I've never met a Mabuti pygmy that owned a blanket. Um, the fire is their blanket. Uh, they get rained on. They have to hover over, you know, some some pieces of wood that have a little bit of an ember still on it to keep their fire going wow. when it when it's raining so bad. Um, you know, if the if they have if they have clothes on their back, um, then they're lucky because uh, because they probably don't have a second change. Um, so I mean, I mean, I don't have to keep giving you analogies, but it's like it's like, but they are also some of the happiest people I've ever met. You mm. know, telling them my story of depression. Um, and telling them my story of addiction. Were they confused them, by that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't uh, know that they truly understand what depression is. Because they're looking is. at you like, what do you mean? Like yeah. You, 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 you wealthy. Right. right yeah. You have, you have a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> How could you be depressed? You have a shirt, uh-huh. right? Yeah. You could Fucking come crazy. from another, another world almost halfway across the world, you know, and come see us. Like, what, what do you, what do you have to complain about? But when I told them that this was really interesting because, uh, when I told him that I was so depressed, because I had actually attempted uh, suicide, um, took a just ton of pills and uh, and drank half a bottle of Everclear and just a uh, ton of Coke and just uh, just was ready to end it, you know. It's, luckily woke up. Um, and when I told him I wanted to hurt myself because I was that sad, like they were like, wait, like they didn't have a real reference for that. They had never heard of someone killing themselves. Um, or no, at least known of anyone that ever had. Because they're fighting for their life every day in a sense, right? Yeah. And they were just like, Hmm. well, wouldn't, uh, this was asked to me, wouldn't hurting you only hurt you? Like, why why, why would you do that? (laughs) It's so simple. You're already hurting. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, anyways, it was just like, it's like, wow, you know, but then, but then looking at that documentary got me thinking, man, we are just in this rat race to get stuff, you know, just to get stuff. And it's like, why don't we have that same kind of drive and tenacity and like wake up early, stay mm-hmm. up late to have great relationships with people, to, to make a difference. Uh, it's, to- it's a fact, I mean, it's weird, but I mean, many of these psychological disorders that we suffer from extreme anxiety, um, depression, you know, a lot of, we have terms for a lot of these things, ADD, ADHD, and all these, a lot of them are, 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 are modern issues, oh, yeah. like modern world, Western society issues and like depression uh hasn't gone down as we've become wealthier and i think there's lots of theories as to why but when i meet people like you and i've met others who seem to be very purpose you know they have a purpose rather than trying to um you know think of like what they need to have to be their perfect life they just find meaning in what they have, you know, mm. like, okay, so things go bad. There's a meaning behind that. And this is the purpose rather than, no, it has to be this particular way or I'm not happy. Um, that seems to be from what I hear from people to answer seems to be the answer. Um, it, it, how much did you, have you grown from this experience in that regard? I'm in, uh, are you anywhere near the day. same person? No, I, I, I've, uh, a lot of my friends and family, like, especially like my mom and dad, like, uh, from, from, from being the bullied kid to then the, the good athlete, they pretty much couldn't recognize me. Mm -hmm. Uh, like you, they said, you seem like a different person there. And that was probably our best decision we've ever made for you to send you that school, Mm -hmm. get you away from those kids. And, um, but then, yeah, it was actually recently my mom, uh, yeah, kind of a cool emotional time. Uh, she was, filming for the documentary did her interview with the filmmaker mm-hmm. and afterwards we went to lunch and she said Justin I can't even really like I remember that time and it's so scary when I broke into your place whenever I found all that stuff whenever mm-hmm. I was worried for your life whenever she took the loaded gun and hit it and um and then she's like I don't even I don't even recognize you like like you f- seem like a different person and so to have that and I I know it I feel it like even talking about some of those things it's it's been uh i think six years 10 months and 16 days yeah 16 days Mm. that uh that i've just been a different dude and uh, i feel like 
as I keep leaning in um, to this, to fight for the forgotten or just fighting for people, um, the farther away I get from that depressed. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that I'm a, like, dude, I'm a work in progress. I can uh, always, I'm, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm jacked up. I have times where I have a pity party and then all of a sudden I have to just remind myself, like, I think that's what sent me into that downward spiral was like, I had blinders on, um, all I could see and focus on were my own problems. Uh, that's all I saw. I couldn't see anyone else's. Uh, it was like, I was looking through, a, I don't know, a microscope at my problems, but whenever I've leaned back and, and been able to take those blinders off, open my worldview or perspective up and, and see others and see what, what actual true suffering is. Um, it's shrunk my problems down to where I might need that microscope again to even try to find some of them. So it's, I mean, that's not true, but I mean, there's, I have problems and different things. That, sure. That and it's, me, it's, and, and it's none of it is yeah, to but the tri- perspective now that you well, have yeah. is, and you know, none of it is to trivialize how you felt before, or if anybody's feeling that yeah, kind of pain, Exactly. but I think, uh, when you, when you, when you step into that, uh, in that role, I mean, it sounds selfish, but, uh, you get, uh, as much as you give, like you're going, you're helping all these people, but you're receiving. Yeah so much from it and a lot of it is uh you know helped you on that on that personal and do you find yourself having compassion or at least coming to terms with those kids that bullied the hell out of you for because you must have hated them forever Uh, do you feel different about them now do you feel any kind of compassion for them now or do you try to understand them i almost feel sorry for them yeah yeah that's what it's it's felt like and i and i wish them well i've even seen some of them uh over the years and uh and had people reach out. I mean, uh, after the book came out and after, I mean, some of those kids that bullied me read my book, you oh, know, shit. And it's, oh. I think it's the third or fourth chapter where they're like, Oh man, if, if How was that, that guy? must yeah. hit home for them. Oh yeah. And so, uh, which I mean, is nice that they recognize it now and it looks like their lives have changed. And then there's some that one that's still a knucklehead or two and, uh, <laughs> one that's put away in another, it's still mm. out being a knucklehead. Um, and so, but yeah, I think it's, it's changed to where it's like, man, like they just must've had a really rough, they were suffering from something too, probably a terrible home life, which I wouldn't wish on anybody, you know? And so, uh, how can, but how, how can we, so I always go back to the forest has just taught me so much, but it's like, how can we go back and just, um, and think about what's truly important and, and, and of value and things to actually worry about, and then, and then things to really put our energy into. And so it's been, I don't know, man, it's just, uh, I wish people could, uh, could, it could, could see that stuff. But then at the same time, like it's tough for me to encourage that because I want people to, um, I don't know. I don't want to encourage that kind of tourism at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, just go there and see how good you have it. Um, but like if you go and there's a real reason and purpose behind it, cause you're going to empower somebody else. Um, but you, it's got to be slow and strategic and you know, play the long game. You know, I think if everybody just found their purpose, it might not be the same as yours, right? But if yeah. everybody found something that they felt truly driven to mm-hmm. do, um, you know, a, a real purpose, mm-hmm. I think that would be it. That yeah. would be the answer. And some people's purpose may be helping animals. Other people's purpose may be helping others, you know, uh, with opportunities and business or life or whatever. But when you find that, if everybody found that and were driven in that way, uh, it is, uh, extremely liberating. I mean, hmm. you talked about the bullies, for example, like, you know, releasing that, that anger towards them or resentment towards them. And, you know, now you feel bad for them and you understand, like, that's not you just being compassionate because you're supposed to. Like that's a that's a feeling that is like you lifted that off yourself. Mm. People don't realize the kind of pain that you carry with that kind of hate and resentment and anger. And once you release that, it's it's gone. Yeah. And you feel it's like you know, some so, chains chains fell off or some bricks fell off your back a backpack of and you bricks. can and you can breathe. Yeah. You know, I mean, we work in fitness and a lot of people get motivated to work out because of that. Mm. That's a huge. I mean, every, everybody we talk to, you know, like. You know, why did you start working out? Why did you start training? Oh, I was bullied. I was yeah. bullied. And you can yeah. see the ones that haven't let it go. Yeah. And it drives them oh, in, yeah. to do bad things to themselves and their bodies. And then those that have released it, it's uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's, it's tran- amazing. Transformative. It's an amazing point. feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how often do you go back to visit the, uh, the, the your some of these tribes that you were with? Yeah. Um, 
it's it's starting to get less and less um, because of the model and method that we're really trying to walk out. That's what I mean. So, there's, so you're starting to see the self-sustaining model. Yeah, yeah. Again. And so Excellent. the less I'm actually, and I'm communicating with our team all the time. Uh, I mean, almost on a daily basis. Uh, except for whenever they're out there in the field, then it's like a weekly basis because they don't have any network or any way to communicate. Um, but I go back about once a year now, um, and or at least that's what it's changing into this year, uh, which is tough for me because I love them and want to be there. But then I also want them to know that this is theirs and that they don't need me. And uh, so, but in the first five years, I was there for close to two um, and one year at one time. Uh, but just trying to, myself mature in a way that, um, that I can walk this out to where I'm not needed there so much. And then maybe I go there one time a year and maybe I go to another place with our team, uh, like whether it's that team in Cameroon or another team somewhere else so that we could start up another, mm. uh, somewhere else. And, Excellent. and make well, an I feel there. like too, you're, I mean, you got the the major ball rolling big time. Mm-hmm. You've created and, the model, and yeah. and yeah. now you're you're probably better served doing stuff like this now. Yeah. I mean, you, you got a crazy lineup of podcasts that you're about to be on. You're going to get exposed to millions of people that get to hear this story that wow. may have not heard. You've got the story. some viral videos on YouTube. Yeah, and, I mean, I book. feel like yeah. th- this now. Um, now that you've got it going and that it, I feel like this is just as important, you know, I, feel I think, yeah, I think there, there's Thank two you. for me, at least when I read about and hear about your story, cause I was familiar with you before you came on the show. There's two things that I really learned from it. And one is, uh, just, um, like I, like we've, like I talked about now several times is finding your purpose. Um, and the second thing is the model that you guys are using to help these people. And not necessarily the exact model, but that whole idea of going in and fi- mm-hmm. and, and working with people there in ways that are self sustainable, so that you can eventually go. Right. Yeah. That you don't, you know, you're not going to be there all the time, and that now they take care of themselves and realizing that they're capable of doing it. All they need is just that opportunity yeah. to, to do so. Yeah, they're capable human beings, and, yeah. and we need to foster that. That yeah. first domino just needs to drop. Just right. needs to be tipped over. And the, yeah. and the, the the key is probably just figuring out what that first domino is. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that could be the, it is the toughest part mm-hmm. for sure. Um, and then, yeah, but like you said, like this part now, um, man, public, uh, maybe it's from the past and everything else. And I actually grew up and uh, I, I had um, uh, speech therapy all the way through elementary school and everything else. And, God, uh, so how hard wow. has this been? And get your TED talk <laughs> yeah. too. That must have been oh, fucking man. nerve wracking, yeah, dude. Absolutely. Wow. Public speaking is my number one fear uh. by far. <laughs> oh, uh, God. Yeah. Out of doubt, I'd much rather get in a cage and fight some guy. <laughs> uh, put me in there, please. Um, because I, my hands shake, armpits all sweat, and everything right before I get up there. Oh, and that TED talk was, uh, uh, I was in the, it was at Warwick University in the UK and, uh, and they put me in the infirmary the night before because I had an over 103 uh, temperature again. They said, man, you got a flu. Well, that was actually, uh, I was going to Congo right after that talk. Um, and that was my third bout with malaria. Um, but it was actually because it, uh, it, that's what it turned into. I did the TED talk on the second day of malaria, my third oh time. My God. Shit. Um, wow. and, oh, my God. Oh, shit. And luckily, I went to Congo right after because trying to get treated for malaria in the West isn't as easy as getting it in, or, or as good mm-hmm. as getting treated with malaria where they have it and where the doctors so are it worked out well for you. <laughs> it did work out well for me. But I actually hadn't, I wasn't bit by a mosquito. It was because I had just fought um, and I had been worn down and my immune system had been shot from the dengue fever and the black water fever. Oh, that was brutal where I didn't urinate for five full days. My kidneys were failing and oh, liver were failing. And whenever I finally did, like our mic right here, that's just solid black. That's what my urine looked like. Uh, it's, Whoa, it was oh freaky. Um, oh, shit. And I think it's like one in, it's either one in four or one in two people pass that get it. Um, and so it was, it was brutal. But, uh, but yeah, so. I don't even know why I was telling that story, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Not really. No, well, we were I mean, just yeah. talking about the, yeah. the, the, the oh. speaking in public oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. the TED Talk and what that must have yeah. been like for you, man. I, I honestly think that, that we can parlay that in this. Um, it's the only reason I'm doing it, because it is that number one fear. But we can uh, we can make a real difference sharing the story and sharing that, hey, it's not about... We've actually changed to where we don't take volunteers there, mm-hmm. um, because that's... 
that's not what's the answer. It's not, it's not the answer to say, Hey, we have these people that are now employed and have their own job and it's their business. And they've now become the black belts or the professionals. Mm -hmm. And let's take over a group full of uh, white belts or amateurs Mm -hmm. uh, to go there and to drill a well for them and our employees or the guys that it's their job, their business, they're the owners. Not as efficient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not as efficient to say, Hey, you guys sit and watch us do this or you teach these. So I can take pictures and show that I'm helping out. Right. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Or, or teach these guys to drill one well for a week or two and then they're never going to do it again. Um, so no, but it's, it's been really cool to see even, even combining the passion that, that, so the purpose is fight for the free out. And, and I still have such a huge passion for fighting. Um, and to take the five years off to come back to the sport, uh, which I don't know, there might be one or two other guys that have done that. And I don't know how successful it's been after a five year layoff, not doing anything. Um, but to be able that's to, that's an eternity dude. When you're, when you're a pro fighter. Oh man, it, oh, it yeah. was. And An come athlete back period. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Come, coming back to the sport was probably the, so drilling the wells is the toughest manual labor I've done. But toughest physical feat would be after five years, two months of zero training um, to come back and fight. And I did it on like a six week uh, notice. Um, Wow. uh, Well, it was actually I had a 12 week camp planned, but uh, corruption in the Congo where they're taking my five year visa away. I had to go back real quick and spend three weeks there. Um, And then whenever I was there, uh, that was taking my training camp down to nine weeks, which is still a good amount for a training camp. Um, but then all of a sudden, uh, yeah, they, they shrunk the fight time down three weeks. They moved it up three wow. weeks. So then all of a sudden I'm in Congo. They're like, Hey, your fight's been moved up from September 15th or something 20th to, to August 28th or something like that. So I was like, Oh man, I got to get back now. Such a so. testament though, to your priorities though, because even something that you've talked about being so passionate about fighting and you love mm-hmm. to still do that 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 still became a priority that because you, you easily could have just said, ah, oh, fuck it. I, I got to fight, man. I'm in the middle of my camp and I'm sure everybody would understand. Like, I yeah. mean, I don't think anyone would be like, we can't expect him to come back and solve this problem when he's got a fight camp. Well, has so, your motivation, yeah. has your mo- like th- that internal driving factor when you're fighting, has it changed from when you fought before? Oh yeah. So now like, who are you fighting for? Oh, them, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, either, as a fighter, you got to be able to fight for yourself too. But at the same time, like it's, it's that is dwarfed by I get to fight for them that I get to my win bonus coming back. I talked with my wife, Emily and, uh, and said, Hey babe, every time I fight, you know, I have this past and I'm going back into this world that is, it's putting myself at risk to one to fight, but two, like to be back in that world that, you know, win or lose, I had a, a reason, uh, to either celebrate or to either numb myself right after with the addictions. Mm -hmm. Like I got to surround myself with good people the entire time. I can't be left alone in that world. Um, and, and yeah. And then, um, I don't know, being able to fight for them and actually even say, uh, the win bonus goes to the cause and we get to drill wells every time. And my sponsors, when they sponsor me, they're actually sponsoring them in the Congo. So yeah, I've even been a part of a new startup company. That's, uh, this, um, it's called eco survivor. The website just launched, um, eco survivor.com. Excellent. And it's this outdoor tech gear company that heard my story that, uh, already had a, a working relationship where they donated to water Four. they had me come in and speak. I was like, keynote speaker at an event. I'm like, oh crap. Um, <laughs> For a guy who doesn't like to speak, you spend yeah. a lot of time speaking. Oh man, dude, it's been nuts. <laughs> and I went in there and talked and afterwards they brought me into a room and said, hey, Justin, this is what we've been thinking about. And they had these outdoor lanterns that were so cool and our team's all using them now in the Congo and all over uh, in those 16 nations. And they're testing all the products that we're coming up with that are, you know, waterproof, weather resistant. They stand up to the elements really well. Um, Bluetooth speakers and uh, battery packs and walkie talkies, walkie talkies that are battery packs and Bluetooth speakers and finding these ways and headlamps and uh, flashlights. They're all extremely durable. But Eco Survivor told me it's so cool to see the companies that give back 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%. But Eco Survivor is doing 50% of the brand wow. uh, back to fight for the forgotten. That's huge, man. Um, wow. Yeah, they have a team of 40 people working on this. And they're going to cool. support them, and then they're going to support us. And so, let's uh, plug that so side again. Yeah, what is it? Ecosurvivor.com? Ecosurvivor.com. dot mm. And what's so cool about it is, uh, is you go to the website, and you'd probably think it's just a a nonprofit website. Mm. With, only on the website right now is the lanterns because those are at market already. Um, and people can buy them online and then we're going to make a big push on Amazon and start releasing products. Um, as we know that they are, um, 
they're ready. They're ready to, to really stand up to, to the Congolese rainforest. Um, and then, so anyone here, uh, but it's really cool because the price points are, are really affordable, uh, for the everyday, um, I don't know, adventurer here, Very if cool. that makes mm-hmm. sense. Very cool. How, yeah. how else can people help, uh, you know, with what you're doing? Yeah. So, um, I would say because we, we, just start implementing the, Hey, no more, uh, volunteers. And we, we've only taken two, two people from our staff at water Four to Congo with me. Um, and that's what I love. Like we're really protecting them there, uh, to be able to do it for themselves. Um, and so, but man, spreading the word, getting, getting that out there. Uh, when people buy my book, uh, from our website, fight for the forgotten.org, um, all the proceeds of that go to the cause. Wow. Um, the, that not on Amazon or Barnes and Noble does it do that. Uh, but on our website it does. Um, and then, yeah, people can donate if they want. There's that world water day campaign where we are trying, uh, to, to, to get that $50,000 to really change uh, that community in Rwanda so that we can also learn from it and do that in the Congo mm-hmm. uh, as well. But man, even a bite-sized amount. So that would be like a one-time gift. Someone could go to world water day uh, at water four and, and donate. Or if someone gave $25 a month, uh, which can be a real sacrifice for some, or it could be a few Starbucks, you know, sacrifice that a couple times a day or a couple times a month. A couple um, times a day for some people. Yeah, a couple <laughs> times a day for some people, right? Yeah, uh, but that changes the lives of 15 people. Um, $25 wow. a month over the course of a year, that would give people clean water uh, for the rest of their life, we believe, because the average water well only lasts 11 months um, in Africa. Uh, but But we train the locals to repair it <laughs> and it's affordable and sustainable. So the, and they have relationships with the communities and they get paid to come back out because we teach the community to put something away to repair it. And it's affordable the way that we do it. Very cool. So, um, where do they go for that? It. Is there a website that they can go with? Yeah. Internet? Fight for the And cool. there's a donate button. And so if you want to give the world water day campaign, that would really help. It'd be a huge boost. Or if you really want to come, I think we're calling it team watermark. So make your mark on the water crisis. Um, and that's the monthly giving club. And when people do that, if it's, I don't know, it's five or $10, you get like a, a keychain and a sticker and like $25. I think you get a t-shirt, um, uh, fight for the forgotten t-shirt and then like for 50 i think um you get a i'll sign you a book and send you a t-shirt and you get the, like keychain and sticker and stuff like that so but it really makes an impact man to i all i know is that man one dollar a day is what they're living on and 25 dollars goes so far so wow. if you can do that every yeah. month that that's that's huge we'll definitely make sure so that all our listeners know that all the links for all this stuff that we've talked about will be in the show notes, will be yep. in the show notes on the website you, so you guys can go directly to all these yeah Excellent, brother. Um, I, I tell you, you know, we get we get the opportunity to meet a lot of really cool people, um, but you've got to be one of the one of the coolest. Uh, there's definitely an energy about you and what you're doing. It's powerful what you're doing. Man. Very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, so Thank you know you. that's why we all hugged you when you came in because we <laughs> yeah. knew Thanks. some of the stuff you were doing, and it's uh, it's hard. It is tough. You know, we talked about being tough guys, but it's very difficult to not get emotional hearing some of these stories and what you're doing and the bravery. Um, so, I mean, just from mind pump, we, we appreciate what you're doing out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I, th- thank you, man. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, listen, if you like mind pump, you can leave us a review on iTunes. Also check us out on YouTube, mind pump TV. We post a new video every single day. Please go to, uh, fight for the forgotten.org donate, uh, to this incredible cause. You know, your money's going to a good place. Um, and thanks for listening. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support. 
And until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>